my name is Jean McGuire, and I want to welcome all of you who are joining us this evening in this uh, People's Voice Forum. Uh, it's a, a forum to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the defeat of fascism in Europe, uh, which uh, was a very significant event, obviously. And uh, we will be having two very outstanding speakers this evening to discuss that with us. Um, the first speaker will be Jacques Pauls, and he is a noted historian and a, a author, specifically on the wars in Europe, both the First and the Second war, World Wars. He has written on both of them. Uh, his books are known, one of them is The Great Class War, which is the uh, book about the First World War, and the second one, um, Second World War, The Myth of the Good War, about America's role in it, and Big Business and Hitler. So those are three of his books, and he has others as well. Um, and he will be discussing uh, the significance of that war and the defeat of fascism. Our other speaker is Omar Latif. Um, he is a member of the Communist Party, a leading member of the Communist Party, and a member of the Committee of Progressive Pakistani Canadians, and well known uh, in Toronto as an activist in that field. So I want to welcome you all tonight. And I'm just, before we start with the speeches, I'm going to ask Drew, who is standing by as part of our technical team, to explain to everyone how they will be able to ask questions when uh, our speakers have finished. Drew, can you do that? Yeah, thank you, Jean. Uh, so comrades and friends, it might take a couple seconds of searching, but you'll see <clears throat> on YouTube, uh, if you're streaming from there on your right-hand side, um, there is a, a live chat, and I can see some of you have already found it and are um, introducing yourselves. So that's good to get acquainted with it. Um, but I, I guess typing questions in there after the two presentations, uh, when we're asked, or if you think about it during the talk, you can put it in there too, and I'll be collecting them and um, putting them into the meeting. Okay, so Drew will be collecting those questions and then when we get to the question period, he'll read them out for us uh, as, we, as we come to them. Okay, so, you know, today uh, we defeated, or fascism was defeated in, in uh, the Second World War, but today we're watching, again, big biz, some big business financing fascism. So I think it's a really good time for us to revisit the issue of what is fascism, what it's about, what its purpose is. And I'm going to call, first of all, on Jacques Pauls to introduce his speech to us. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Jacques. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. It's a, an honor and a pleasure to be here this evening and to share a bit what I know about the Second World War and the First World War and the connection between the two. And I should say right away that I agree with many historians who uh, today, looking back uh, the 20th century, see the First and Second World War are as two parts of the same big conflict. And that conflict is usually called the 30 Years War of the 20th century. Now the 30 Years War is not a very familiar, big, widely known concept in North America, as far as I know, but in Europe, it rings more of a bell. The 30 Years War was actually fought from 1618 to 1648, so quite a long time ago, uh, mostly in and around Germany, and it ended up wiping out about a third of the German population. So it was a very long and very bloody conflict, and it lasted indeed 30 years. So when historians today uh, talk about the 30, 30 years war of the 20th century, starting in 1914, so to speak, and ending in 1945, so 31 years actually, they really conjure up this idea of a long drawn out conflict very murderous, and also I should point out, very complex as wars tend to be, and especially world wars, because it involved many participants with many different objectives, and representing many different values, ideas, social and political systems. You can already see what I'm getting at. So um, the Second World War, certainly, to focus on that one then, part two of that big conflict, First of all, it can only be understood if you know a bit about the First World War, and we could back to that later on. But I just want to focus on what, what we are de dealing with today. That's the, the last day, well, the, the victory and the great conflict of 1939-1945 was May the 9th that the guns, the guns fell silent. That's, so let's, let's focus first on the Second World War, 
And uh, as I just mentioned, wars are a very, very complex historical phenomena and world wars are even more complex. And this one, again, like, um, like the 30 years war of the 17th century had many players to use that term. It was a stupid term really in the context, <laughs> but people, you know, many sides involved in it and uh, representing many different values and uh, going for different objectives. So um, the, we should know to simplify things as much as possible, not, not make it too sim simplistic, um, is that, that it was a war really, it was two wars rolled into one. And uh, in this respect, what it was, was first of all, not first of all, maybe second of all, but it was on the one hand, a, an old fashioned conflict between great powers. And here I should say not, not too old fashioned because the great powers involved were imperialist powers. Uh, imperialism being the, the manifestation of the capitalist system and in, in, that emerged in the, 19, in the late 19th century. It is basically capitalism on a worldwide international scale involving the heartland, you know, the, met, the, the metropoles like Britain and France and you, Germany and the United States. And on the other hand, the, uh, the colonies. And I'm sure that Omar is gonna say a few things about that later on. I can see already, you know, we're getting ready for that. I'll, I'll leave that to him. But uh, essentially what we're saying is that the first the second world war was a conflict among imperialist powers. And that of course is what the first world war had also been. You know? um, and uh, as such it involved two blocks of, imperi of imperialist powers who while, while they were together fighting the common enemy, the other imperialist block, also had difference amongst themselves and different objectives and rivalries and competition and so on. I'm thinking, for example, the fact that in the Second World War, the United States and Britain were great allies, but uh, certainly the rivalry, the traditional rivalry, going back to the days, the years before the First World War between Britain and, um, and the United States, uh, the rivalry, even in hostility in which Canada was involved, of course, I mean, that was not a thing of the past by, the, by 1939, 1940. And it's fair to say that while, while the United States and Britain were united in their opposition to, to Nazi Germany, they were still also in, sense in, in this sort of conflict rivalry situation. And it's fair to say that while they were both eliminating in the long run with the help of the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, that the, the United States also managed actually to to, to eliminate, you might say, Great Britain as a great rival in the Second World War by means of, for example, the Lend-Lease program, which, which was a system of loans to Great Britain, which people assumed too easily were a free gift, which they were not. They were loans at high interest rates, which Britain only paid off, I think, in 2007 and really got the country broke. And um, as, as Churchill at one point said to Roosevelt, I mean, you, you, you basically, you're, you're, you're killing us. And Roosevelt said, well, do you want, do you want them the credit or not? Because otherwise you're gonna go down, you can win the war against Germany. So that, that, that there is a typical example then of countries that were fighting alongside and on this one same side in this conflict against Germany, but weren't necessarily the best of friends or certainly didn't have the same interests at heart. But it was a conflict among imperialist powers. And on the one side, it was of course, Nazi Germany the big imperialist threat, so to speak, the big, the big boy that was a threat to the, the other big boys, namely Britain, France, and um, the United States. And um, that is one thing to keep in mind. But in the sec at the same time, the Second World War was also a conflict between the side, you might say, of capitalism and the side of socialism. And in that respect, actually, you might say that the side of socialism was clearly represented by the one existing socialist country at the time, and when at the same time a pretty big power, and that was the Soviet Union. And capitalism was represented by, we should not forget that, by Nazi Germany, as well as the United States, as well as Britain, as well as France, everybody else, essentially. And um, here I should point out right away that it's totally wrong what some historians will try to tell you that Nazi Germany was not a capitalist system, a capitalist country. Nazi Germany was 100% capitalist under Hitler, uh, even though there were some, some, some minor aspects of the system that has, have been sort of cited to, just to claim, to support claims, to fake, phony claims, you know, unjustified claims that Nazi Germany was not capitalist. It definitely was capitalist. In fact, Nazi Germany was a paradise for capitalism. You know, the big bankers, the big German banks and the big German corporations did very, very well under Hitler. You know, before the war and after the war and during the war, they made a lot of money. And by the way, as I point out in my book, The Myth of the Good War, 
those German banks and especially corporations that did very well under Hitler because of his regressive social policies and because of his imperialist, imperialist expansion, you know, included also the, um, the, the, the branch plans in Germany, active in Germany, of foreign corporations, of which a lot of them were American. You know. And that is, again, something that I emphasize in my book on the Second World War, and that yet most historians will never, ever, ever talk about that. You know, I mean, they just mentioned it's as if this was of no importance whatsoever. The fact that, for example, Ford and General Motors had huge factories in Germany that produced untold amounts of weapons, including tanks and trucks and airplanes for the Nazis. And again, contrary to the idea that, that the fake idea that Nazi Germany was not capitalist, it was capitalist and it did pay the bills. Hitler paid the bills. And of course, when you ask them how did Hitler pay the bills, it was by basically by the, the losers in the war were going to pay the bills. The Jews paid the bills, the conquered countries paid the bills. Uh, the, 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 basically, Nazi Germany robbed France, robbed Holland, robbed Belgium blind to pay the debts it owed. And, uh, and it kept, kept, kept paying money. In fact, the, um, the big German corporations and banks kept making money until the very, very end, which then caused a problem too, because they did not intend to give it all up when the war ended, did they? But that's a different story that'll take us into the Second World War. I wanna go back to what I was saying then about all this, that this was a conflict also to simplify it between capitalism and socialism. Uh, capitalism, the bit, all the big, the big imperialist countries, even though they were at, at war against each other, right? And then the one socialist country, the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union also was a state which in, in, in a war needed help where it could get it. And that would lead to this great coalition, you know, that, that as it was called, I believe, you know, the anti-Hitler coalition between the Soviet Union, the capital, the socialist camp, and some of the countries in the imperialist camp. And that Britain especially, and even the United States. Uh, but the United States, we should keep in mind, entered the war reluctantly. You know, the United States backed into the war. The United States at first really had no desire to enter the war, at least not, a, in, not enter the war against Germany. Against the war against Japan was a different thing. That, that war they always wanted, which is, why they, which is why they provoked the attack on Pearl Harbor. But that's, again, a different story. We can get into that later on if you want to. I just want to mention then that, that the war was a complex conflict. Two conflicts rolled into one. And when today we commemorate the victory in that war, then we have to ask who won and who lost, or who, who won and who didn't really win, okay? We, gotta, we call it, I think the title of this is the victory over German fascism. And that's fair enough, because the Hitler system, Nazism, uh, was indeed a form of fascism. It was the, the, the German variation, the German brand of fascism, as Mussolini's fascism was the Italian brand and Franco's the Spanish brand, and you know there was brands of fascism in every country. And uh, so the war is often presented as a war against fascism. And the defeat of uh, the most important form of fascism, German fascism, was in many ways was, was presented as victory over fascism. Fascism was defeated. Well, I have news for you. Fascism was not defeated. Fascism is still around. In fact, I want to read a little poem from Bertolt Brecht that, that comes to mind in this respect. And for those of you who know German, I'll read it in German first and then I'll be translated for you. It says, So was hat einmal fast die Welt regiert. Die Völker wurden seiner Herr jedoch, dass, dass keiner von uns zu früh triumphiert. Der Schoss ist fruchtbar noch, aus dem das kroch. And that sounds maybe a bit, you know, like a, a hard to understand, but it's, it's wonderful lines. Let me translate it. The entire, the entire world was almost ruled by such a monster. The nations managed to crush it. But let us not rejoice too soon. The womb, is, the womb it crawled from is still fertile. All right, so what we are saying here is that, but now what Brecht is say, was saying by that is that even though fascism, Hitler fascism, Nazi German fascism was defeated in 1945. In many ways, fascism survived. And it survived, and I'll just give you a couple of ways in which it survived. And, and in which, in, in a sense, then, it shows that for many of the, the great powers on the imperialist side of that conflict, such as the United States, and particularly the United States, 
it wasn't really a war against fascism. Fascism was not really seen to be the enemy. In fact, as the United States helped to defeat fascism in Germany, because Germany was an imperialist rival, you know, but not because they had anything against fascism. You know, they actually saved the fascists in Germany in many ways. In fact, many leading fascists, including major war criminals, were given a passport and repatriated and sent off to save to, to live happily, long and happy lives in South America, as you know, and in Canada, you know, quite a few of them. And not only German fascists, but fascists from Eastern Europe, from Croatia, from Ukraine, you know, and, and you name it. And another way in which we can illustrate that fascism wasn't really wasn't really the, the enemy for the Americans was that at the end of the war in 1945, it would have been very, very, very easy for the combined powers of Great Britain and the United States, plus Canada, plus the Canadian troops, to simply make a phone call to Madrid and tell that awful dictator Franco to step down, get the hell out of there, or else we're coming. You know? And Franco would have had to pack his suitcases immediately and get the hell out of there. But instead, he wasn't bothered at all. Even though everybody knew he was a fascist, he was well, he was nominally a fascist, but he presided over a fascist system that kept on executing people, you know, victims of the civil war for years on end, you know, and nobody ever undertook anything against that. And it's also fair to say that when the United States set up a new, presumably new, presumably democratic state in Germany called West Germany, the Federal Republic, which is today has expanded to include the West, the, the East, it annexed the East. It wasn't a, not a reunification, it was an annexation of Eastern Germany by Western Germany. That West Germany, as it was set up in the late 40s, early 50s, under Konrad Adenauer, that was full of recycled fascists. You know? I mean, the big, most famous example of that is uh, Gail, Galen, who was the uh, was basically one of the, uh, the secret service men of the, Nazi, of the Nazis, active in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union. And he actually was, uh, was recycled by the Americans to become, to become the head of the, uh, the West German Secret Service. Ran, ran it for many years together, hand in hand, happily, basically like Siamese twins with the CIA. You know. And uh, many, many Nazi generals who had to you know, work diligently for Hitler were recycled to serve in NATO, in fact. And, and so there's a, there was a lot of German Nazis, fascists, who had, who had, to be the, had been the enemies, so to speak, during the war, but were you know, basically co-opted, were adopted in the great happy you know, Western family you know, after the war. You know? So fascism really had not been the enemy at all. The German Reich had been the enemy because the German Reich was a serious challenge to first the Brits and later on to the United States. In the in the in the rate the rush or the race the conflict among imperialist powers to see who was to decide who was going to be the the master of the whole system you know who was be the, the the hegemon you know the, the who was who was being charge we all know who that would be it would be Uncle Sam right so the so fascism was at the enemy in fact in my book the myth of the good war I cite a few some 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 American generals from West Point who were at one point during the war still moaning that we're fighting against the wrong enemy on the side of the wrong ally. Meaning, why are we fighting Hitler? He's a good guy, he's a fascist, you know? And why are we fighting with the commies? You know, we should be fighting with the fascists against the commies. And that is something that actually uh, also appears from a number of other things. There was, you may know or may not know that at the end of the war, as it was clear that Germany, uh, that Nazi Germany was kaput, that, but guys like Patton and Churchill were seriously considering, and I mean seriously considering, you know, using, joining up with what was, was left over of the German army, and there were still quite a few men there, you know, to basically march to Moscow, you know, and, and, and Patton was very keen to do so, and so was Churchill, and they would have done so, except for one reason, you know why they didn't do it, because the American soldiers wanted to go home. And the American, I have a wonderful quote in my book about an American soldier who said, you know, Patton is crazy. He said, I thought it was a guy, a veteran, saying afterwards, after the war, Patton was crazy. He wanted us to march to Moscow. He said, we didn't want to march to Moscow. We wanted to go home. And we didn't want to march to Moscow, first of all, because the Red Army soldiers had fought with us, and we respected them and loved them for what they had done. Because they had made all the sacrifices that made our life much easier and probably saved our lives, right? And secondly, we knew what the Red Army had done to Hitler's army at Stalingrad. And we didn't want to go to Moscow. You know? 
And in fact, in the United States, there were strikes and there were people who were clamoring or writing to their congressmen, we want the boys to come home. Yeah. And also it would have been very, very difficult for Washington, London to suddenly explain that we made a big mistake, guys. Sorry, we've been fighting the, the Nazis, but they weren't really bad guys. They were good guys. And we've been fighting with the Ruskies and they're not the bad guys. So we're going to march to Moscow. I mean, that was something that the, the public never would have swallowed. It would, take, it would take many, many years to socialize the public in the West to view the Russians as bad guys. And the Nazis sort of us well, most Nazis, not the bad ones are dead, but I mean, most of the, for example, the, not the German generals are pretty decent chaps, you know? I mean, Hollywood has made it a point to show guys like Rommel as pretty nice fellows, essentially. You know? I mean, they were war criminals, no doubt about it. But of course, they, were never, they were smart enough never to join the Nazi party. You know? They were the kinds of conservatives, straight-laced Germans of the old system that liked Hitler a lot, as long as he did, as he produce the successes which they wanted to share with him. But once they started to lose, they, they distantiated themselves from him. And they pretend that they had never been Nazis. You know, and there was many, many bankers and industrialists as well. And today, if you ask in Germany, if you ask big industrialists, not that I ever get to talk with them, but to any of them, or bankers or so, or, or the historians who write the books on their behalf, there's quite a few court historians, as we call them, you know, who, who are paid sometimes to write a history of German corporations. I could give you some names of that. You know, they always say that they, they, the, the general claim is that we didn't, we didn't want to build all this aircraft. We didn't want to build things, but we were forced to by Hitler. You know? And the bank, we, we, but we, have, we were forced to. It's just not true at all. It's just not true at all. The Nazi system was a system whereby the bankers and industrialists decided and Hitler did what it was expected of him. You know? That's why they picked him. They brought him to power. Another lie of the Third Reich is that Hitler was voted into power. He became the dictator democratically, so to speak. It's just simply not true at all. But just to come back to, to fascism. So fascism was not, not, it was not the fascist aspect of Germany that caused the United States to go to war. I'm talk, focusing on the United States now, but you can say much the same thing about Britain and even about France. <clears throat> it was essentially the fact that it was a major competitor. <clears throat> but um, fascism, in the 1930s, for example, was looked upon rather benevolently by the elites in Britain, in France, in the United States, in Canada as well. You know? And I mean, the political elites, the, 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 the financial elites, the industrial elites, the church elites, you know, I'm not saying that the, the ordinary priests or so were like Hitler, but most of the people, the higher ups, the elites liked Hitler, they liked fascism. And they liked them because because they were basically, fascism was not a revolutionary system out to change the established order. It was the opposite of that. Communism, socialism, that was the system that wanted, that was the threat to the established order, to those on top, the elite, the ones we sometimes call now the 1%, you know, uh, they hated communism, socialism, you know, because it represented revolution. And that was a threat to their system, right? So they had nothing to do with it. And uh, they liked fascism because fascism was the, the, the opposite of communism. In fact, in fact, wherever fascism raised its ugly head, starting in England, starting, and it's not starting, it started already earlier, but when it came to power in Italy in 1922 with Mussolini, the first thing it did was wipe out the commies, the Reds, as well as socialists, social democrats, about, you know, as well as labor unions and so on. So from the perspective of capitalists, bankers, industrialists, and many others, you know, that was a fine thing to do. In fact, when, when Mussolini did that, Churchill, for one thing, was sometimes ridiculously praised as a great Democrat, which he was not at all, you know, had high words of praise for, for Mr. Mussolini, who was a great, the great gentleman from Rome, he called him, you know. And in the United States too, most people liked, liked Mussolini a lot. And even Hitler was a, was a good guy because as soon as he came to power, he basically threw all the commies into jail, into concentration camps because the jails weren't big enough to accommodate them all. I mean, most people don't understand or don't just know that the first concentration camps in Germany were not set up for the Jews. They, they, their turn would come later, but for the communists. 
which of course included quite a few Jews, as we as we all know. But that's a different story again. So what we are saying is that that after the war, the First World War, and after the Russian Revolution, especially, you know, uh, to the elites in France, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, you know, the great threat was actually the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union embodied it incorporated the revolutionary threat to the system which they represented. Right? And the problem was, especially in the 1930s, in the context of the Great Depression, when things were tough as they are now, you know, that more and more people in the West, even in the United States, which is many people believe there was never ever a single communist or a single social in the United States. No way, they were all, they were all owned capitalism only. It's not true. It was the red 30s, the dirty 30s were the red 30s, you know, when the communist parties and socialist parties and, and anarchists and all kinds of revolutionary elements and groups were actually having success. And that scared the hell out of a lot of people of the elite in these countries. So the big, and they all felt that there was all the fault of that country over there that, that, that symbolizes the revolution, the cradle of the revolution, you know, and they're the ones who basically who orchestrate all this, this revolutionary threat. So we got to get rid of that. Right? So the great, the fear of the Reds, the great red fear, that was the big thing, right? The red peril. Now, how do you combat that? How do you, what's the solution for that? Well, the solution was fascism. Because wherever fascism came to power, as it did in Italy with Mussolini and in, in 1933 with Hitler, first thing he did was basically just close down the social, the communist parties and the socialist parties, throw the commies in jail, you know, sh shut down the labor unions. And right away, you know, the, the revolutionary threat was gone. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get this guy to do the same thing on the Soviet Union? And this is where Hitler became interesting because Hitler in Mein Kampf, which was published in 1925, had spelled out clearly what his big mission in life was. It was the destruction of the Soviet Union. And that's what he wanted. He didn't want war with France, he writes in Mein Kampf. He wanted war in the East. Germany's future was in the East, in the Soviet Union. So that's where we have to march. We have to march to Moscow. Now, that was music to the ears of people in the elites in France and in Britain and also in the United States. Because it meant that this guy, you know, this new, this new fellow there, with whom we could do, by the way, good business, was going to use the military might of Germany, which was still very, very big, you know, not to bother us. No, he's going to go and march east and destroy the Soviet Union, which we hate anyways. I mean, what could be better? What could be better than have somebody else do the dirty work, which in a way we would prefer to do what we can because our public is against it. And besides, we tried because at the end of the First World War, during the French Revolution, the, the Russian Revolution in 1918, 1919, the Allies, the British, the Americans, Canada, the United States, Japan, sent troops to intervene in the Civil War in Russia, not to help the Reds against the Whites, no, to help the Whites against the Reds. You know? And these Whites weren't exactly wonderful Democrats. I mean, they were basically the, the Tsarist forces who represented a medieval system, essentially. So Churchill, presumably a great Democrat, had basically sent troops to help, you know, to help to try to restore a feudal system, worse than, worse than, I'd say, <laughs> the, one of the most authoritarian systems and the most exploitative systems that you can think of. So the idea was then that fascism was the solution and communism was the problem, right? So the idea that we're going to fight a war now in which we are going to fight with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany, if you would have told somebody to, that's going to happen, it was, it's impossible. It's, it's the opposite of what we want. We want the opposite. And that's why, as I mentioned later on, and even during the war still, there were generals in, 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 in the States who said, we're fighting with the wrong ally against the wrong enemy. You know, that we have to change that. Let me also point out that, for example, in the United States, the United States never wanted war with Germany, especially since, since when Hitler started to prepare for that war, which was to go, go against the Soviet Union. Yeah. When he started to prepare for that, he had no money to, and he had no weapons because Germany was bound by the Treaty of Versailles to have only a tiny little army of 100,000 men, no air force, you know, and oh my God, how, how, how can that man do the job and not knock off the, the commies in the Soviet Union if he doesn't have a serious army, you know? 
So Hitler started to rearm and fine, we close our eyes to that, you know, because we wanted to have a big army, right? And then he comes to power. Well, he was already in power when he started to rearm, obviously. I'm a little confused here time-wise. But then he needed to build tanks and airplanes. And he needed all kinds of stuff to fight that war. So he goes to the big companies in Germany, including the branch plants of American companies like General Motors. He says, I want you to build tanks and trucks and planes. He says, Shem, how are you going to pay? How are you going to pay? He said, well, I'll borrow money. You know? Well, if you want to borrow money, why don't you go see the banks? You know? And the banks are keen because they have money, the, the, the German banks and American banks, yeah, and loan him the money yeah, to go and buy from their friends. And this is where the United States was again involved big time because, uh, because by through his friend, Jalmar Schacht, a famous German banker with an American connection because he had lived in the States, he actually managed to borrow money from American banks to float bonds, Nazi bonds. Yeah. And with that money, he went to buy what he needed in the United States. Actually, he also, he bought from the branch, the American branch plants in Germany, like Ford and General Motors. But he also needed something else for the United States. Because you see, it's one thing to have lots of tanks and airplanes, Stukas and all that to attack, to carry on a lightning type of warfare, which is a motorized warfare, which involves tanks driving hundreds of thousands of kilometers, you know, and airplanes flying, Stukas bombing it. Where does Germany going to get the fuel? Because if those planes and those tanks could run on beer, Germany would have had no problem because there's lots of beer in Germany. But oil, zero. Petroleum, zero. The reality is that Hitler had to import and stockpile before the war petroleum. And whether you get it, the answer is from the one country that was still the, main, the major producer and exporter of oil, of petroleum, before the war, and that was the United States. And here's the, the typical example that the best example of that is a banker in New York in the 1930s who specialized in actually floating bonds, America, uh, German Nazi bonds in the United States, promising a good return to money. And that was the Union Bank of New York, whose uh, the head was Prescott Bush, the grandfather of, of, well, the father of one president and the grandfather of another president. And a lot of people think that the Bush family were always in the oil business. No, they, they got into the oil business. Why? Because Prescott Bush made so much money, basically raised so much money for Hitler and saw that he was using it to buy oil from his friend, the Rockefellers, that he told his son, George, come over here. Here's so much money. Go to Texas and get a new oil business. There's wonderful money to be made. And I'll get you some contracts with Nazi Germany. And actually, when Nazi Germany attacked Poland and later on Belgium, Holland, France, the Soviet Union, it was mostly with oil that, that was, was, had been sold, sold to him at very high prices you know, by American companies. So, so Hitler's plan to launch a war to destroy the Soviet Union was a wonderful arrangement from the point of view of the elites in all these countries, because it meant that he was going to wipe out that pain in the neck embodiment of the, of the revolution, the Soviet Union, a source of inspiration and guidance for our own goddamn Reds. And secondly, by preparing for this war, we're making the money because he's buying from us. But hold for a second, Mr. Hitler, we're, bought, we're loaning you the money, the banks, you know, and you use that money to buy from our colleagues here from Ford and General Motors to buy all these weapons. But how are you going to pay us back? He said, well, that's easy. You know, the war is going to be an ordinary war. The war is going to be a war of conquest. The losers will pay. And that's fair enough. That's fair enough. That's, you got credit. You know, in other words, we'll, the, the payment will come from the conquests. And that's indeed what happened. Hitler did finance his operations you know, starting in 1939 and 40 by looting the countries he conquered. You know, when he entered Belgium, for example, he got all the gold out of that, that Belgium had quite a bit, mostly from the Congo, you know. Anyways, so, so, so the war was going to pay. And that's why when these business people in the 30s, when they dealt with Hitler and they sold them all this war equipment and and the petroleum needed to, to, to fight these wars, that they never had any qualms about that because they knew damn well the war was going to be against the Soviet Union and they loved it. And that, that rape of the Soviet Union was gonna enable Hitler to pay back, pay the bills. So in fact, that war had to come sooner or later because we can't wait forever for Mr. Hitler to pay his bills off, right? So that's what happened. That's why in this context, we can understand, for example, that the United States had no plans for war 
against Nazi Germany at all. Because in fact, all the great le the leaders of, 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 of uh, the United States, the political, the economic, the financial leaders, they all loved Hitler. If you would have told them, don't you want to go to war against Hitler? They would say, what for? And if he, they would have said, well, he's a racist. So what? We are racist ourselves. So he's anti-Semitic. Well, we're anti-Semitic ourselves. In fact, you may or may not know that the, that the major source of anti-Semitic inspiration for Hitler was Henry Ford, who wrote a book in 1922 called, called The International Jew, where he basically blames socialism, communism, the Russian Revolution on the goddamn Jews, because Marx was a Jew and Hitler was, I'm sorry, not Hitler, and, 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 and Trotsky's a Jew and Lenin was a Jew. He was not, doesn't matter, all Jews, you know? For, for the, from the perspective of, of Hitler and Ford, you know, uh, communism, socialism was actually an invention by the Jews to subvert the natural God-given supremacy of the white folks. And it was just those jealous Jews, you know, that are among us. That's a problem, right? Because the blacks and the, you know, and, and, and the brown people are also, also, but they're not here. But I mean, the Jews are among us. So, so that's a big problem, right? They're among us, you know? And they, they just like, they're inferior, but they're, so, they're dangerous, they're jealous. And they've invented this system called socialism, you know, communism, you know, to basically subvert us. And the Russian Revolution, that was the work of the Jews. By the way, a lot of people still believe that today, you know that, right? And it was the Russian Revolution was the work of the Jews. And the Soviet Union, as Hitler saw it, there was Russland unter Judenherrschaft. That's Russia under the Jews. You know, the communist regime in Moscow, that's the Jews running the country. Yeah. That was his idea. And that's what, that's what, where did he learn that? He learned it from Henry Ford. And actually that was what, generally speaking, what anti-Semites everywhere believed. Yeah. And that's why the idea that Hitler was a racist and an anti-Semite, that didn't bother anybody. I mean, it was expected. I mean, of course you were anti-Semite. I mean, you had, you got, you were an anti-communist, you were anti-Semite. Anti-Semite, you were anti-communist. The two were the same side, the two sides of the same coin. On the same coin, not the same side of two coins. <laughs> anyway, so you get the picture. So there was no plans for war against Russia, against Nazi Germany. The United States had plans for war against three countries, Japan. And indeed, that's a different story. You know, but the, the attack in Pearl Harbor, that was a provoked arrangement because the United States wanted war against Japan. I, I can tell you, explain to you later on, if you want, if you have time, why. You know. Secondly, Mexico. And we say, why Mexico? Well, wars against Mexico had always been very, very productive, you know, very profitable. You know, in the 1840s, the war against Mexico had landed a bit of real estate, you know, in, in, on the side of the American border. Think of California, New Mexico, Arizona, and you know, that's a, that's was a third of the, of, the, of the territory of Mexico. You know, I think they're going to give it back shortly, but maybe not. Anyways, in the third country, the third country for which the United States had plans for war in 1939, 1940, was Great Britain and Canada combined, seen as one. Even though we were already more or less independent, I guess at that time it didn't matter from the perspective of the United States. Canada was still part of, of Britain, and those plans were 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 made public in the 1950s. And everybody laughed it off. <laughs> it was so embarrassing, right? And what did it include? What did it involve? It involved bombing three big cities in Canada. Because they weren't going to send the bombers over to Britain, to Britain yet. They weren't going to bomb Canada. They expected Britain to send troops to Canada you know, to, to fight a war. And of course, Halifax would be where the Navy would land, right? Well, therefore, we bombed the hell out of Halifax. And Toronto and Vancouver. Yeah. With poison gas bombs, by the way. And I'm not making this up, okay? I'm not making this up. This is totally, totally, the, the documents are there, it's totally known. Like I say, when this came out, it was a bit of a, bit of a it was pretend that it was a joke, but it was not. There was no plans for war against Nazi Germany. None whatsoever. In fact, when I ask people, when did the United States declare war on Nazi Germany? Most people don't know that. And they usually then say, well, uh, at Pearl Harbor, you know, December 1941. And I said, well, it's close. It was around that time, but it wasn't really at that time. And besides Pearl Harbor, that was the Japanese attacking an American possession, colonial possession, you know, without the Germans even knowing about it. So the day after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt asked the Congress to declare war on Germany. Uh, sorry, on Japan. And he did not say, and while we're at it, let's declare war on Germany. Some historians say, oh yeah, Roosevelt won a war against Germany. It's, it's not true, he didn't, he didn't, it's not true at all. 
In fact, because Germany had nothing to do with it. Hitler had to read it in the paper pretty much. But Hitler declared war on the United States on the 12th of December, five days after Pearl Harbor. And it came as a big shock. It was totally unexpected in Washington. Totally unexpected. In fact, that's a fascinating kind of a tidbit of information that most people aren't aware of. And uh, it has some interesting implications because what happened to the American companies, the American branch plants in Germany? You know, did Ford, General Motors, IBM, ITT, Singer, sewing machines now make, mach now make machine guns for the Nazis? Did they keep operating? You never read anything about that in the movies, uh, in, in, in the books, right? You know, and Hollywood is not going to make a movie about that, you know? But the fact is, yes, they kept on operating. And if you would ask, if you'd ask managers or people of these companies, weren't you guys active in Nazi Germany and doing the war? They may say, yes, uh, from 1939 to 1941, but we're a neutral country. Therefore, that was fair, right? I mean, and, you know, neutral countries, you know, we're not at war, so we could sell oil and we could do business. So, yeah, but what about after Pearl Harbor? Oh, oh yeah, I'm glad you're asked. Oh, of course, not glad you're asked. But yeah, that's right, yeah. No, but we confiscated. We were confiscated. Our, our, our branch plans were confiscated by the Nazis. Okay, end of discussion. Is it true? No, it's not true. It's an outright lie. They just kept on business as usual. And they kept on producing. They kept on making money. Okay, big time until the very end. In fact, during the war, they made even more money than before. And why is that? Because the Nazis kept paying, by the way, you know? For example, with the gold or the teeth of their Jewish victims and, and so on. Yeah. But why did they make even more money? The answer is slave labor. Yeah. Slave labor. I mean, labor costs, as you know, are a nuisance for, for capitalism. You know, that that is so it would be so nice there'd be no labor costs whatsoever, of course, right? I mean, to minimize them, that'd be great. But I mean, it's kind of hard to do without workers of some sort, less and less, of course. But the problem was slave labor. That's the favorite, it's the favorite of all it's slave labor. It's Cheap, very cheap. All you have to do, the only cost involved is a bit of a few potatoes a day for food and you have to pay, make a donation to the SS because they have to look for the discipline, you see. And that, that, that solves the problem. So that is why they, they, they did wonderful business at that time. Now the, um, the branch plans then did not close down, were not closed down by the Nazis. The American branch plans kept producing for the Nazis. And uh, the war, the war basically con continued. Then, for them, bus was business as usual. But the, the question was, and the question I should get to is, why did Hitler declare war in the United States? Because he didn't have to. It was he didn't have to at all. And and he, in fact, some people say, oh yes, he had to because he was an ally of, of of Japan. So he had to. It's not true. They were allies, but committed to come to each other's defense in case the other party was attacked by somebody, not in case the other party attacked someone. When Hitler attacked Poland in 1939, Japan didn't declare war in Poland. When Hitler attacked Belgium, Holland, France, and today, to tomorrow exactly 80 years ago, on the 10th of May, 1945, 1940, Japan didn't declare war in Holland, Belgium, and France. When Hitler attacked the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June, 1941, Japan, which had already fought an undeclared war against the Soviet Union in 1939 and got a bit of a bloody nose, said, did not declare war in the Soviet Union, although there was a great, great concern, a great worry in Moscow, but it didn't. So Hitler had, was not forced, absolutely not, to declare war on the United States because he was an ally of, of Japan. He could have done what Japan did to him when he started his wars, send him a, a success card, say, to hope you do well, you know, good luck, you know, good luck with your war, but we don't get involved in it, but he did. And the answer why, the reason why Hitler did declare was out of total desperation, out of desperation, because he thought declaring war would be the only way to avoid the catastrophe, which was already appearing on the horizon. Because he declared war on the 12th of December, 1941. Okay, so five days after Pearl Harbor. Of was the 11th, uh, a few days earlier, a week earlier, on the 5th of December, Hitler's generals had shown up in his office and told them, Mr. Hitler, can't win the war anymore. You're going to lose the war. You're going to lose the war. Not right now, but you know, can't win the war anymore. Why is that? Because in front of Moscow, where we were only about 20 kilometers from the, from the Kremlin, you know, the Red Army launched a counteroffensive and they've beaten the hell out of us. 
and we're just barely surviving. In fact, we'd be lucky to survive in the winter, you know, and that means we are going to lose the war. Because as you know, Mr. Hitler, he wouldn't tell him, tell him that, but I'm telling you that. We also went to war to the Soviet, against the Soviet Union, not only to fulfill your lifelong dream of destroying the Soviet Union, the cradle of communism, but we also did it because, because to get our hands on the resources of the Soviet Union, to first of all, pay off our debts to the banks, that's, but that's a concern for later, but to keep on fighting the war. Because we have to fight the war to keep on fighting the war meaning we have to defeat the Soviet Union to get especially the oil fields of the Caucasus and the agricultural riches of Ukraine and whatever else they have the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will be for us what India and Pakistan had, had been to, you know, to, to Britain, what the Wild West, the Congress of the West had been to, 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 to the United States, meaning a big agricultural heartland, chock block full of resources, of raw materials, to feed our population, to feed our factories, to get, keep us going. When Hitler launched the attack on the Soviet Union in June of 1941, the German army had petroleum to fight for four months and no more because the stockpiles had run low as the Panzers had overrun Poland, Holland, Belgium, France, and now the Soviet Union. Right? Well, now they were about to over in the Soviet Union. And that would that involves hundreds of thousands of millions of miles of travel for all these machines, right? Because there was hundreds of thousands of airplanes and tanks involved. So it was a must for the Soviet Union, for the Germans to defeat the Soviet Union within four months to get the oil fields of the Caucasus. And that was the idea. And how long did it think it was going to take? Well, in, in Berlin, on the eve of the attack on the Soviet Union, it was firmly believed that the war would might take something like, like two or three months, be game over. Because Russia was seen, Soviet Union was seen as a very weak country run by a bunch of Jews anyways, you know, who didn't know the difference between, you know, but they're not that good Germans who know how to fight a war, right? It'll be, it'll collapse. The Soviet Union will totally collapse. In fact, in Britain, where they were happy that Hitler attacked the Soviet Union because Britain was the only country still fighting at that time, France had been eliminated, they were very happy. They fit temporary relief because in Britain too, the army high command figured a couple of months, eight weeks perhaps. And the same in the, in the Soviet, in, in Washington. The belief that the, the, the expressions used were of its glory, of its power, of its fame, will go through the Red Army like a hot knife through butter. That's exactly the term used by the journals in England at the time. And at first it looked that way, didn't it? At first, it looked really, really, really good. But already after a few weeks, the advance started to slow down. <clears throat> and by the fall, it was already obvious to many cognoscenti, many observers who knew that things were not going the way they should. In fact, the Germans were supposed to have, the German soldiers were supposed to have been back in their factories by September 1st. And it was still a long way from the Caucasus. Right? And then as things were getting desperate, then on the 5th of December, the, the Red Army launches a counteroffensive. And that's the end of the dream of defeating the Soviet Union in that year, or for that matter, at any given time after that. And that is why, that's why Hitler is sitting there. He's been told that he's going to lose the war. Yeah. He can no longer win because he doesn't have the, he does, didn't defeat the Soviet Union. And they know the Soviets are still very strong. And by the way, we all know that the Soviet Union suffered enormous losses, especially those, that first summer of the war, but so did the Germans. Yeah. The Germans lost a, like a half a million men, you know, which is a, for them was, a, they had never, never in the previous campaigns in Poland, Belgium, Holland, uh, France, they had never suffered that kind of losses. And they ran into weapons that they didn't know the existence of. Hitler was furious at the secret services that the Soviets appeared to have tanks and all kinds of weapons, superior tanks and weapons, which they produced by the way, and don't let anybody tell you that the Soviets survived only because the generous Uncle Sam provided him with weapons, which he did not. In fact, at the beginning of the war, the American ambassador in the Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union, sent a warning to Washington, don't supply any weapons, don't sell anything to the Soviets because they're not gonna survive for another few months. So it's just by the time the by the time the weapon's gonna get here, the, the Nazis will get it. In fact, <coughs> Lend Lee's help to the Soviet Union only arrived a year after the, after after the Soviets had single-handedly 
with their own efforts and with their own equipment survived the, the attack by the Nazis. Right? So that is why Hitler then is thinking about that, that he's gonna lose the war. And suddenly he realizes maybe there's one way to get out of this because he re reads in a paper essentially the day after Pearl Harbor that Japan, his buddies in Tokyo have attacked this, not the United States without telling him anything about it. <clears throat> and he has no obligation whatsoever to help them in the war against the United States. But he does declare the United States as a dramatic gesture, which he hopes will impress Tokyo so much that Tokyo will declare war on his enemy, the Soviets. And if they, they do that, you have to keep in mind the bulk of the Japanese army is in Eastern China, occupying a part of China in Manchuria, Manchuria. <clears throat> and they attack the Soviet Union there then the Red Army will have to fight a war on two fronts. And then that's Hitler's logic. And then maybe, just maybe we still have a chance to win the war in the Soviet Union, or maybe come to a, some sort of conclusion, an armistice or whatever, right? That's not a possibility. So Hitler, it's a tremendous gamble. And very likely his generals told him, I don't know about that, you know, and that may not work. And then you're gonna have another enemy, the United States. But Hitler says, well, that's not a concern right now because it'll be years before the Americans will show up here. And then he was right. The Americans didn't really show up until 1944. And I'm talking about December 1941. So anyways, I want to tell you then that that, that is how, how the United States became involved in the war against Germany, which it didn't really want to become involved in at all. And that is, explains then why they were fighting now against Germany, even though they didn't want to, and they certainly aren't fighting against, Nazi, against fascism against Nazis, and they don't mind that at all. What they do mind is that the ambition of Germany you know, to control Europe and to challenge the United States, which is itself aspiring to supremacy, you might say, in what we now call the Western world, you know, the imperialist world, if you want. And that is something <clears throat> that is something that, uh, that that is another another issue. Then that you know, that, that that it shows again this this complexity of the war because you have on the one hand, the countries, powers, imperialist powers fighting each other. At the same time, also you have the conflict between capitalism and socialism. Did I talk too long already or can, <laughs> is it okay? I don't hear, see, hear anything there, but shall I stop here maybe? And uh, we can always come back to some of this later on. I, I can't hear anything. No. I'm sure people are really going to want to ask a lot of questions, Jacques. You've really opened up uh, a whole number of issues that I think people are going to really want to get okay. in, engaged with. Um, so that a wonderful presentation with an enormous amount of information there. Oh. It's, a big topic. it's a big topic. It is a big topic and you covered an awful lot of it. So we thank you very much for that. Um, our next speaker is going to focus a bit more on the effects of the war um, and the role of the defeat of fascism and, and as part of that uh, on, on Asia. So Omar, who is known to many people and, and as I said, active both in the Communist Party and the um, Committee of Progressive uh, Pakistani Canadians, I'm going to turn it over to you, Omar. Take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. All right. Uh, uh, what Jacques said about the uh, American branch, uh, branch plants in Germany reminded me of my friend David uh, at university uh, in 1979, uh, an American, a Jew. His father was a pilot in the Air Force. And when American planes went to bomb Germany, they were instructed not to bomb American plants like Ford, which were making uh, tanks. Anyways, my topic, the role of colonies in World War II and the war's impact on them. Just a bit of a background. We all know that European colonization of the Americas be began with Columbus's westward journey uh, of 1492. The colonization of the South and the East begins six years later with the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope in 1498 by Vasco de Gama. Though Latin America, excepting the Caribbean, had gained its independence from Spain and Portugal in the 1820s, the maps of Africa and Asia, almost 100 years later, show a completely 
colonized region of the world. I don't know if I can show you this uh, slide. Uh, I will try. Click share and click here. Now, now, okay. Asia, Southeast Asia, Southern Asia and Africa were fully colonized. And prior and during World War II, Lenin's fierce denunciations of colonialism and demands that the colonies be unconditionally and immediately freed, followed by weaker demands in President Wilson's 14 points, raised the morale of the liberation forces fighting the respective colonial governments. The formation of the League of Nations, but especially the smash, smashing open of the Tsarist prison house of nations and the freeing of Finland from Russian rule brought about by the great October socialist revolution of 1917 raised those hopes even higher. Post-World War I did see a few changes, not to the betterment of the colonies though. The, uh, Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire uh, was uh, weeded down. Egypt, uh, Syria, and the uh, Middle East that it controlled was given over to France and to England. German colonies in Africa, which is now the Cameroons, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Namibia, they were given also over not to freedom, but to Western countries for uh, administration. There was a significant change in the East. Japan had already invaded and occupied uh, Korea in 1908, but in 1931, they invaded and occupied Manchuria, a very rich, relatively rich province of uh, China. While the war in Europe uh, began, began formally uh, in September 1939. In Africa, it can be said to have started with the attack of fascist Italy against Ethiopia, the sole remaining independent country on the co uh, continent in 1935. In the East, the start date is usually considered to be 1937, two years before 1939, that 1937, the year when Japan expanded its war massively into China to try and conquer all of it. As uh, Jacques explained, Nazi Germany used the resources of Europe to wage its war. Britain had always depended upon the financial, material and human resources of its colonies in the Caribbean, Africa and Asia. The renowned Indian economist Utsapat Naik drawing on nearly two centuries of detailed data on tax and trade, calculated that Britain drained a total of nearly $45 trillion from India during the period 1765 to 1938, $45 trillion. Imagine how much more staggering the sum would be when all the wealth of all the colonies that Europe is at, has added up. It is no exaggeration to say that it was not Britain that fought World War II, but it was the British Empire. Millions of soldiers from the Caribbean, from the Middle East, from Africa, from India, from Southeast Asia were pressed into the, the war by the allies. Britain became even more rapacious during the war years. One stark example is the, is the Bengal and East India famine of 1943 that killed up to 3 million people. Yet Churchill callously refused to open up government granaries to keep food flowing to the war effort. The death figures in World War II in Europe are well known, not so much in the Eastern theater of war. Japan's expanded war against China and its invasion of Southeast Asia in 1941 with 140,000 troops from 
1931 to 1945, resulted in the deaths of more than 30 million people, the overwhelming majority of whom were Chinese. Some figures go even higher. The brutal bombing of Guernica in Spain became a symbol of Nazi brutality. The rape of Nanking, when the Japanese butchered in cold blood 200,000 Japanese, or the Japanese abduction of a quarter of a million Chinese and Korean comfort women to serve in military brothels are huge war crimes also. For communists and progressives in the colonies, like their counterparts in Europe, the war had two main parts. For almost two years, from September 1939 onwards, they categorized it as an inter-imperialist war. But with Nazi Germany's attack on the Soviet Union in 1941, and seeing what the Soviet Union's defeat and Germany's victory would mean for the world and the colonies, their view was that fascism had changed qualitatively to a people's war against fascism. One final note on the war itself. Defeated, militarily and economically exhausted, isolated without any allies whatsoever, completely dependent on imported natural resources, Japan could have been blockaded to force it to surrender. However, that would have taken time. The Soviet Union, having de uh, defeated Nazi Germany on May 9th, turns its attention towards East and attacked Japan in Korea and Manchuria. Any si say by it in Japan was anathema to the US. The criminal use of the atomic bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, monstrous war crimes on August 6th and August 9th were both to forestall the possibility of any Soviet influence in Japan and a threat that the US would use or could use atomic weapons against it too. The end of the World War II, it started the process of liberation of the colonies. Quickly, Libya gained its independence from Italy in 1947. The Indian subcontinent which comprises in today's Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, with a population of 400 million people and considered the crown jewel of the British Empire, also gained its independence in 1947. The next year, Sri Lanka gained its independence and a very large country ruled by a small European country, Indonesia gained its independence from Holland. Uh, people in Canada will be familiar that a lot of migration from Holland came to Canada precisely because of this reason, because jobs and wealth were uh, lost to, to Holland. While South A East Asia was liberated from Japanese rule in 1949, 45, much of it remained colonized by England and France till another decade or so. The biggest change came, of course, in China. Having led the fight against the Japanese invaders, the People's Liberation Army, headed by the Communist Party of China, went on to defeat the nationalist Guomintang, supported by the US. On October 1, 1949, the world witnessed its second October when Mao Zedong announced the establishment of the People's Republic of China, free of foreign domination. While Egypt, Iraq and Syria had become independent of Britain and France in the 1930s. The colonial powers maintained troops and a stay in their and a say in their internal affairs. It was the colonel's coup of 1952, whose most famous leader was to become Gamal Abdel Nasser, that saw Egypt become fully independent, with Syria and Iraq and Libya to follow thereafter. Algeria, after a long bitter, brutal war of liberation that cost one million lives, finally won its independence from France in 1962. Many countries in Sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, after exerting relentless pressure, combined in some cases with armed struggle, as in Kenya, 
and Zimbabwe compelled European powers to quit in the 1960s. Belgian Congo, now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, gained its independence in 1962. After long lasting guerrilla wars, Angola, Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau finally gained their liberation from Portugal in 1975, the same year that tiny, heroic People's Army of Vietnam drove the US out of their country. The reasons for the liberation, some colonial apologists say that the West seeing the badness of its ways gave up the colonies out of the goodness of its heart, of their hearts. Nothing, nothing can be further than the truth, from the truth. There is another notion that colonial, that European colonial powers exhausted by the war with fascism had to give up their colonies, that that has some truth to it. There is a third reason which is given. The Soviet Union, China, and the socialist countries of Eastern Europe firmly supported the aspirations of the independence movements in the colonized world. There is truth to the view that the longer the colonial powers denied independence, the more radicalized, the more favorable towards the Soviet Union and China did anti-colonial sentiment turn. The naval mutiny of February 1946 in India, in which the flags of the Congress party, the Muslim League, and the Communist Party of India were hoisted by the ship's masts together was a striking example of this. However, I think the main reason, the main reason was that revolts and rebellions and fight backs against colonial invaders were as old as colonialism itself. The revolt in India in 1857, called a mutiny by the British, and the first Indian war of independence by Marx is evidence of this. Another example is Umar al muhtar born in 1858 and made famous in the 1981 movie, Lion of the Desert starring Anthony Quinn, fought the Italian occupation for 10 years till his defeat and hanging in 1931. The main reason for the independence of the colonies was that the desire and struggle for independence increased with coupled with increased capabilities, economic, organizational, military, with millions having gained experience in armed combat, combat, grew so strong that European colonial powers were compelled to give uh, independence to them. Colonial powers didn't give freedom to China or Vietnam or Indonesia or Angola. It was wrested from them by the peoples of those countries led by the likes of Mao, Ho Chi Minh, Soekarno, and Augustino Neto. Colonialism, the direct physical occupation of countries did end in Asia and Africa in the 1960s, as it had in Latin America in the 1820s. But the power relations between the former colonial powers and the colonies remained the same. The extraction of wealth by the former from the latter continued to be by more indirect means. I would like to end by repeating the words of Luis Corvolan, who was the general secretary of the Communist Party of Chile in 1992, when imperialism was celebrating the 500th anniversary of Columbus's landing in the Americas. Said Corvolan, if memory serves me right, for 500 years, the relations between the North and the South have been like that of the Greek mythical creature, the centaur, half human, half beast, the rider and the ridden. Half a millennium is enough. We must all be equally human. Thank you so much. Very good. Thank you very much, Omar. That was, as always, from Omar, uh, an excellent uh, speech. 
Um, and I thank Jacques as well. They, they both, they've set us up for, I hope, a really interesting discussion. Um, at this point, um, to our audience, I hope you're still there listening and writing your questions in. We will open the floor to questions and I will ask um, whether Drew has anything uh, there in, in his question area. Drew? Sure. So I'll, I'll shoot two out there uh, that have been asked and then hopefully um, friends and comrades can put, put some more out. So one, there were a couple of questions asking Jacques to talk about the books that he's written um, and where, where people might find more information uh, from the presentation and, and other stuff that you've written. And also there was a request to talk about the, um, the, the Soviet German pact, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Molotov pact. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, that's, the, that's... the historians like to focus on the supposed alliance between the two against the against the West. Well, but my books that they are my books were published in Toronto by a very respectable. Imagine that a publisher. Uh, friends, some friends of mine are shocked that I managed to get my books published by a well a progressive. I must say, I respect uh, the, the publisher, the progressive publisher James Lorimer was quite known for, we might say, liberal Canadian nationalism, you know, that kind of stuff. But, you know, they, my books are not exactly, I say, mainstream. <laughs> and um, I was very happily surprised that they, they accepted it. In fact, I kind of sense they would because they have published some other books in, along the same line. So so that, that's pretty good. They're pretty open-minded. And uh, I'd say I'm, I'm very happy with them. They published my three of my books that have, were, were published in English. Some of them are in French and have not yet been translated. But um, my book on the first one, the chronological, was actually the last one on the Second World War. It's called The Myth of the Good War. So if you put in, if you uh, Google Lorimer, L-O-R-I-M-E-R, -E then my name, simple P-A-U-W-E-L-S, like everybody knows, Powell's, and then Myth, Good War, then boom, you'll end up right on the website. My second book was going back in time, Big Business and Hitler, so that deals mostly with the interwar period. And my most recent book is actually was was called was called the Great Class War. It's about the First World War. So I started with the Second World War and worked my way back. And I've uh, I am now they're going to publish next year a book called The Great Myths of Modern History, which deals a bit with all of these things plus the French Revolution as well. So that's about my books. And the question about now the Hitler-Stalin Pact or the Ribbentrop Pact. That is, a, that is, of course, the big one in many ways. And I've written an article about it, which you can find it was published by in two on two blogs. One is, you may know, Global Research based in Montreal. So if you put in Jacques Powell's Global Research, Hitler's Stalin Pact, you'll find it. And the other one is Counterpunch in the United States. You may also know is um, based in California. I think I'm not really sure they published it as well. In that my book is it's, it's article is called um, the Hitler Stalin Pact Myth and Reality, and the Hitler Stalin Pact has come into the news recently when the European Commission, you know, the European Parliament, basically approved a motion to declare to officially state that that was basically when the Second World War started, and therefore we should both blame Hitler and Stalin for starting the Second World War, you know, even though for some stupid accident of history, Stalin ended up on the right side with the good guys. That's us, of course. Well, it's actually the other way around. My, my argument in, my, in the article is that it is thanks to the Hitler-Stalin Pact that the members of the European Parliament are not sitting there in Lederhosen speaking German, because if it wouldn't have been for the Hitler-Stalin Pact, Germany would have been in total control in, of Europe, all of Europe, not only in 19, the 1940s, but even today. And the reason I can say that is that the Hitler-Stalin Pact essentially was the precondition for the, the victory of the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany in the Second World War. It is thanks to the Hitler-Stalin Pact that the Soviet Union survived the onslaught of the world's mightiest military machine in 1941, with great sacrifices, great losses, undoubtedly, but survived and lived to continue the war and ultimately win and made it to Berlin. Without the hitler stalin Pact, that would not have happened. And because the Soviet Union defeated Nazi Germany, we won the war. 
Today, if you watch too many Hollywood movies, you think the United States single-handedly won the war. Many history books deal with the Second World War and have maybe a little chapter on the war at the Eastern Front as if it was like only like a sideline. Side we uh, we over, over exaggerate of the importance of the, the Battle of Normandy, the landings in Normandy. They were no longer necessary. They were not needed. I earlier made a point that, that Hitler was already told he could no longer win the war on the 5th of December, 1941. That is actually before the United States became involved involuntarily in the Second World War. So the idea that the United States actually dealt the, the death blow to the Nazi beast is not fiction, Hollywood fiction. It's just simply not true. The, the Hitler was already basically doomed. You know, Hitler, Germany was doomed already after because of the failure of its offensive of its attack on the Soviet Union. I told you why, because they would, they would no longer have the wherewithal, the, 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 the oil, the fuel, the, the, the resources to keep on fighting a long war. They, was just, they were just doomed. So, so the key to the whole thing then, the key to winning the war was for the Soviet Union to survive the onslaught when the Nazis attacked in June 1941. And here I wanna tell you something, the Hitler-Stalin pact so there's lots of lots of aspects to it that, that that deserve being illuminated, and I do that in my article. But I want to focus on one aspect of it: the Hitler-Stalin Pact made it possible for the Soviet Union to recuperate a big chunk of territory of the of Russia, of revolutionary Russia, that had been lost to Russia, which when it became the Soviet Union, and that territory has gone down in history as Eastern Poland. Even though it's not Poland at all. Today, it's part of the Ukraine and part of Belarus, all right? But if you look at the map of Poland before the war, there's a big chunk to the east, that area, right? All the way, virtually all the way to Kiev, right? And all the way to, almost all the way to St. Petersburg, Leningrad, right? So Poland was much more to the east, okay? But Poland wasn't supposed to have been there. Poland was created, was recreated, you might say, you know, because Poland had existed in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries as a great power in tandem with Lithuania, stretching from the Baltic to the to the Black Sea, which was bigger than, you know, it was just an empire, really, essentially. And it had gone, had been divided, had been divided up for reasons which we can get into, and it had ceased to exist. Half of Poland was owned, was controlled by Germany before the First World War, the other half by the by Russia, and by Tsarist Russia. And then the Allies, who were at war with, with Germany, decided that after the war, an independent Poland would, would be brought to life again. And where would the borders be? Well, the heartland of Poland, Warsaw, and so on, and then stretching it you know, to the party to the west with Germany. And how far to the east would it stretch? There, a commission of the Versailles, the Versailles of, the, of the negotiations that would lead to the Versailles Treaty, agreed on what they call the Curzon Line, Curzon being the uh, British Minister of Foreign Affairs. And they agreed on a sort of line, an ideal ethnic line. But there's no ideal line, really, because the, the, it's an ethnic mix in Eastern Europe, as you may know. It's a mosaic. It's not a clear, a clear sort of a river dividing Poles from Ukrainians and so on. But this was more or less an ideal line, the, 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 the Curzon Line. And uh, it is, it was actually far, quite a bit to the west. It actually, it is pretty well where the border of Poland is today, the eastern border of Poland is today, right? But when, when the civil war, when, when Poland was made independent and became a democracy, a liberal bourgeois democracy, inevitably under some military hero called Pilsudski, it immediately virtually transformed into a dictatorship of Pilsudski. And these guys, these guys had delusions of grandeur. These guys that ran the new Poland, it was essentially, I could say a fascist system you know, run by the military, the Catholic church and the, the top layer of the bourgeoisie at the expense of everybody else, essentially. And they, their dream was to recreate the great Poland of the 17th, 18th century, stretching from sea to sea, from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, okay? And the opportunity to do that occurred because the Soviet, no, the revolutionary Russia, was involved in the civil war, right? And that gave the Polish army an opportunity to invade. And it was a bit of a war that went back and forth a bit, but it ended with Poland occupying a big chunk of what should have been the Soviet Union. But the Soviet Union had to give it up because they were too busy fighting their own civil war and lucky you know, to survive, especially after the foreign uh, allied interventions. So at one point, the war was ended in 1922, I believe, with a treaty in which, in which the Soviet Union recognized the loss of that territory to Poland, 
having seen no possibility of reconquering it, especially since Poland was supported by France big time. In fact, it was with the help of France that Poland had conquered these territories in the, in the first place, especially since the Soviet Union had become the black beast of the allies, having basically gotten out of the war. You know, you may know about that. So Russia, uh, sorry, the Soviet Union had lost territory that now became known as Eastern Poland. All right. Now in the in the Hitler-Stalin Pact, there was Poland was there was spheres of in, of influence were created. The pact was, by the way, just simply a non-aggression agreement. It was an agreement not to attack each other for the time being, for the duration, until we see fit to to do so, you know, to attack each other. Everybody knew that. And pacts like this had been concluded between Poland and between Nazi Germany and, and Poland earlier and Britain and all kinds of others had concluded pacts with Nazi Germany, but we don't we don't normally hear about them. It's only the Hitler-Stalin pact that is always talked about. But in that pact then, where there was an, a, a clause that allowed for spheres of influence. And the spheres of influence was, were allowed for the Soviet Union to have the border influence over its former border. In other words, that was clear that, that, that the Soviet Union was kind of hoping to recuperate that territory sometime. You know, now you may say, well, that's awful because they should never have done that. Well, if you think so, that it's also, also consider condemn France for wanting to Alsace Lorraine back after the First World War and after the Second World War, because France had lost Alsace Lorraine as a result of a war. It had recognized that in a peace treaty with Germany, but that didn't stop the French from saying someday we're going to get it back. So we can hardly blame the Soviet Union for wanting back, wanting to recuperate a territory that, that they had that they had been theirs and they had to give up you know, under duress because of the result of the war, but they were hoping to recuperate it. So that was obviously clear that the Soviet Union wanted to get it back. Now, what happened is that Poland collapsed when the Germans attacked it. We can talk about why that was. And the Red Army moved in. It did this, by the way, did not make the Soviet Union an ally of Nazi Germany, okay? I mean, the, the, the pact did not make them allies. There was no alliance whatsoever. Strictly an agreement not to attack each other. And then this agreement to the zones. Some people say, well, the Soviets should never have moved in. That's unfair. Well, what should they have done? If they would have done nothing, Nazi Germany would have occupied all of Poland, all the way to, 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 to the border with the Soviet Union. And that would have meant then, that would have meant that in 1941, when Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union, they would have been able to start from about 300 kilometers further east than they did because of the signing of the pact, which did allow the Soviet Union to recuperate its former territories, the wrongly called Eastern Poland, thereby moving the border with Germany 300 kilometers further to the west and forcing the Germans to attack much further from Moscow than they actually, that, 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 as they, that they would have done had, had the Soviets the Red Army not moved into Poland, right? By the way, the, 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 the pact not only gave, allowed the Soviet Union some space to, but also some very useful space for defensive purposes, but also time, because the attack was actually, Hitler was, was prepared. We had, we had to know that. Hitler won a war against the Soviet Union in 1939, not against France and all that. He wanted to move into the Soviet Union pretty well immediately, but he couldn't because of the complication of the situation. But what it meant then that the, because of the pact, the Soviet Union gained time and space. The time was well used in many ways, but I won't get into that. Let's talk about the space. So because of that, the Nazis had to attack in June, on June the 22nd, 1941, from 300 kilometers further west. That's a long way from Moscow. We do know that in the days, in early December 1941, the spearheads of the Nazi army were virtually within sight of the towers of the Kremlin within less than 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, I'm not sure exactly, of the Kremlin. So just imagine for a moment that they would have been able to start 300 kilometers further east. For sure, they would have entered Moscow. For sure, they would have taken Moscow. Now, nobody knows if that would have meant that they would have won the war. We Presumably, losing your capital is not necessarily losing the war. I mean, Napoleon took Moscow, but still lost the war, right? But, but certainly, the chances that the Soviet Union might not have survived, you know, the onslaught, are much greater. So there's a very good chance that without the pact that the, that the Soviet Union might not have survived the Nazi attack in 1941. Thanks to the pact, they did. Thanks to the pact, they, the Germans did not manage to lay their hands on the oil fields of the Caucasus. Had they done so, had there not been a pact, 
had the Nazis been able to attack from 300 kilometers further east, had they taken Moscow, we don't know for sure, but had they then defeated the Soviet Union, they would have had the oil of the Caucasus and their army would have been intact. And then, dear friends, when the Allies in June 1944 would have landed in Normandy, they would have had to face not, not even 10% of the German army, which caused them a great deal of difficulty. Even though they were all there, the British, the Americans, the Canadians, yes, we're all there, you know. We had a hard, hard time against 10% of the, of the Germans. Without the pact, the Germans might have taken all of Russia, all of the Soviet Union, who would have the oil. Their entire army would have been in Normandy waiting for us. And if you ever seen even movies, sometimes inadvertently give the truth about the war. Some of you may remember seeing The Longest Day. I saw it as a kid in the, in the 60s and it shows it shows, it's actually, some of it is pretty good in black and white. It shows the Germans, two German pilots in their airplanes flying a mission over the, over, over the, over the landing beaches, right? And they fly for about an hour and the guy says, we gotta go home now, we have no more fuel. And that's a reality. And by 1944, by the time the allies were fighting, were landing in Normandy, the Germans had no more oil. They were out of gas. They were literally out of gas. They had wonderful tanks, Tigers, Panzers, they had wonderful aircraft. They had jet fighters, right? But they had no fuel. If they would have had the fuel of the Soviet Union, they would have blown out bombers and out Spitfires out of the sky. We would never, ever, ever have been able to land successfully in Normandy, never. And as I mentioned, the members of the European Parliament today would be sitting there in Lederhosen, stretching out their arm and saying Sieg Heil, you know, all the time, because that would have been the reality. Europe would have remained under German control. So thanks to the hitler stalin pact, didn't happen that way. But there's a lot more to it, and I recommend reading that article. It's about 10 pages, and it's in, it's in Counterpunch or in Global Research. You can find it for free on the internet. Right. Thank you, Jean. Uh, was there, I'm sorry, I, I got so caught up in that, I forgot. Was there another question there? <laughs> Drew, remind us, what, what, what was the... Uh... Those, were, those were the two. He's, he's answered the two, uh, but I've got more if you want to hear them. Okay, unless Omar wanted to chip in on no. those. No, no, you'll wait for the other questions. Go ahead, Drew. Okay, so um, there's a couple more related to the molotov ribbentrop pact so i'll just uh i'll just spit those out and then give you another couple too so um could the speakers maybe speak a bit about the ussr's attempt to convince france and britain to invade nazi germany weeks prior to hitler's move to poland um what is the relationship between the pact and the decision by nazi germany to invade western europe and the uk if there is a relationship. So those are the two on the pact, but then we've got, uh, well, thank you for the great presentation. What was Hitler's motivation to declare war on the US? Did he have information about the lack of readiness? I think you went into this a little bit in your presentation, but I think they're looking for more information there. Um, and Okay, this is a big question. What economic or political interest was achieved by imperialism, German imperialism, by uh, the Holocaust? Can you please explain the political economy of um, yes. anti-Semitism? Well, okay, I'll talk about that because I have answered the question already about why the United States, why Hitler declared war in the United States. I did answer that. I said a desperation. It was, mm -hmm. He thought it was the only way that he could possibly, dra by dragging Japan into the war against the Soviet Union, forcing the Red Army to fight on two fronts. He just thought, maybe, maybe just, just maybe we can still win this war. It was unlikely, but he, and he was also speculating that the Japanese would be honorable men who would just simply reciprocate with an equally uh, unnecessary gesture, gratuitous gesture, and they didn't. And therefore he was, he was screwed royally, essentially, right? He ended up with, with even more enemies. So that was, uh, that's the one, the one argument. But the, the, that's, that's the, was my answer to the question about why, the, why Hitler declared war. On the, on the United States. But the other question was about the, the, the Holocaust, Auschwitz, and how it fits into the whole economy. You gotta, there's a number of ways, and I write about that in my book on Big Business and Hitler, because that, that's very important. Auschwitz represented, in many ways, it epitomizes the, um, the, the whole aspirations of the, the Nazis with respect to, uh, to the Soviet Union. As I mentioned earlier, this, the war of Nazi Germany against the Soviet Union 
had two major aspects. One was the desire the, 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 of Hitler to, to fulfill his life's mission to destroy that cradle of communism, the Soviet Union, which he saw, remember what I said that earlier, we see saw as Russia run by the Jews, okay? So anti-Sovietism, anti-communism, and anti-Semitism are linked, all right? They're linked. I mean, it has always been so. Anti-Semitism is much older in Europe. In the Middle Ages, you know, there, there was no Soviet Union, there was no communism. Therefore, anti-Semitism was there, was not linked to those other isms. In those days, anti-Semitism was a Christian thing, right? And the purpose of anti-Semitism was to make the Jews see the light, the light of Christianity, that is. And if a Jew saw the light and converted, he was baptized and he was a good guy all of a sudden. If not, he might have to, might have to burn you at the stake. I'm sorry, but that's just the way, we, the way it is. But if you convert, if you're on the spot, your sins are forgiven. You're good. Hitler never said, if a Jew converts to Christianity, <laughs> no, 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 no. The same anti-Semitism of Hitler was a different, different anti-Semitism. And it was shared by many non-Germans. It's too often presented as if Hitler was an anti-Semite. Or the Germans were anti-Semites. That, that's not true. There were anti-Semites in Germany. There were many non-anti-Semites, many keenly so. There was a stupid book written some years ago called, called, called um, what's his name? Gold, Goldhagen, is it? About how all the Germans were anti-Semites. Hitler could do what he did because all the Germans were anti-Semites. I mean, that's a racist argument. The guy got a, got a professorship at Harvard. Can you imagine that? You know, just for saying that, you know. But it's so dumb. But but it's it, 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 it's it's an idea that, that is functional in this society, in society. Why why did anti-Semitism get this connotation, this anti-Marxist connotation, this anti-communist connotation, not only in Germany but all over Europe and in the United States? It happened in the late 1900s, in the late 19th century, in the late 19 sorry 19th century, in the late 1800s. The 1800s are the time of the Industrial Revolution. At a time of when 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 capitalism is, unfold, is unfolding its majesty, and basically adapting a um, an imperialist stance, and uh, while capitalists, bankers, entrepreneurs, and so on, business people are doing very well, the massive masses of people, and we're even talking about the colonies, you know, we you know about that, and that's worse there. But even in Europe, are very poorly off, and they're unhappy, they're ticked off, they're restless. And oh my God, they're following the teachings of that guy Marx and becoming socialist and talking about revolution. Oh my God, you know, that's, that, that, that's awful because I'm not talking about the perspective of the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the industrialists, the bankers. And uh, so they have intellectuals, don't, 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 let's not underestimate that. And these intellectuals say, well, it's true, Marx has a problem, there is poverty, but he's wrong by saying that the solution is that we are the problem and that the solution is to overthrow our system. No, the system is totally fine except that it's tough, you know, the, the, the life is like that, you know, that's where Darwinism is brought in, you know, social Darwinism, you know, that's just the way it goes, to survive of the fittest. We survive, we thrive, because we are the best, the brightest, the smartest, we're the hardest working people, you know what I mean? And the others, even when they work hard, they, they, they're just dumb, you know what I mean? They, we are, you're just a smart, bright, brilliant, you know, we're beautiful, you know, da, 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 da. so the idea is that we, we have to explain then why, why is there problems. Why is the poverty? The poverty is because that's that the way it is. They're all, the poor will always be there and they're poor because they're inferior. We, the white man, are on top. I'm sure that Omar will appreciate what I'm saying here. And the others, the, the others are at the bottom because they are inferior. I mean, the white man is, the, is just the brightest, the hardest working, you know, the, the most in, the, the most initiative uh, and all that stuff. And the others are just, they're just lazy bums or stupid, you know, and that that's the way they are. You know, there's nothing we can do about that, you know. And, uh, and of course, they're jealous. Of course, they're jealous. Of course, we, they, if they can't, they, 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 that's the way nature of the beast. So we have to keep them under control. And they're jealous and uh, some of these inferior people and they make a, a sort of a, a kind of a hierarchy, right? The white men on top and then the less white men at the little below that, like as you go to the Mediterranean, they get a little colored, you know, a little brownish, you know, like Italians, you know. Not as good, Greeks, you know, then Middle Eastern people, North Africa, then the blacks, the Chinese, oh, you know, all inferior, inferior, inferior. But the Chinese are far away in China, the blacks are in Africa, you yeah. know. But some of these inferior people are amongst us. That's the Jews. Because we can't tell them by their color. We can maybe tell them by big noses or something like that. But they, most of the time, we don't know. But they hate us too. 
they are very sure they're the greatest danger to the Jews. And it's the Jews that are amongst us and they want to subvert our system. They are our great enemy. And they're doing it to do that. They've invented this, this ideology called socialism. And which is now also becoming communism at one point, right? It's invented by a Jew by Karl Marx, right? And then other Jews like Trotsky and you name and you name it. Look at all these Jews, and that's these are the guys that you know that are you know, that, that that's the problem. So that is how anti-Semitism then becomes associated with anti-Marxism, anti-socialism, counter-revolutionary thinking, and after the Russian Revolution, anti-Sovietism, anti-communism, anti-Sovietism. And that's why in the 1920s, Henry Ford in the United States, he associates, associates, he mixes his anti-communism, anti-Sovietism with anti-Semitism. He's the guy who writes about the international Jew. Jews everywhere basically are dangerous. It's a little more complicated than I'm going to make out to be because Jews are not only the commies, they're also the plutocrats. Okay, they're attacking us. It's a two-pronged attack. Above, they're the bankers, they're the Rothschilds, they're the, the plutocrats. And below, it's Trotsky's, the Marxists, you know, the commies, right? And oh my God, we're, we're beleaguered. So these guys are so bad that they, they want to wipe us out. And the only remedy is for us to wipe them out. I'm sorry to say that, but it's not like Christianity where we can convert them. No, 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 no. They, you can never convert a Jew. They're so out to get us that the only way we can get rid of that problem, it's like a, it's like a, a virus. It's like a virus. You got to get rid of it. You can't just say, well, well, we'll tame it. We'll teach it good manners. No, no, no. You got to get rid of it. And that's why Hitler's anti-Semitism will lead to an extermination of the Jews. Women and children, everybody has to go. Because if you leave the women and the children, they'll, they'll become adults and they'll, they'll have the same problem. The suburb problem will never be solved, right? So that's why, that's the background of Auschwitz. Now, Auschwitz is also more than that because Auschwitz, as you may know, when the Jews arrived, those who were not fit to work were immediately gassed, okay? The old folks, the women and children immediately gassed, immediately from the train right to the gas chambers, right? Those who could work were put to work, all right? And this is important. Just outside of Auschwitz was a big factory, all right? What factory was that? It was a factory run by IG Farben. What's IG Farben? IG Farben was a huge petrochemical trust. It was a combination of firms, which actually still are with us today, doing very well, thank you very much. They're, they're making good money for their, for their shareholders, who are probably the descendants of the shareholders in the 30s. Uh, IG Farben supported Hitler because they saw that he was the guy who was going to do what they wanted him to do, including imperialist expansion, you know, and uh, provide cheap labor, for example. They do that. So IG Farben, today, Bayer, BASF, B-A-S-F, you know, Hoechst, H-O-E-C-H-S-T. These are big names. These are, this is the elite of the, the corporate Germany today, okay? They're still with us. After the war, there was a move to, to declare IG Farben a war criminal organization, which they were. But the Americans said, oh, can't do that. We're going we're gonna to just basically break them up. You know, we'll punish them. You know, we'll break them up and let them be on their own again. Why was that? Because IG, because IG Farben had a big connection with Standard Oil of New Jersey. So that's the Rockefellers. So there was another American-German connection there. That's rather important. So IG Farber had a big factory set up outside of Auschwitz to take advantage of the cheap labor, okay? Because the labor, I told you, was a problem. Those millions of German soldiers who went to war in June 1941 in the Soviet Union were supposed to have been back two months later to be back in the factories, to keep the factories going, but they didn't come back. Millions of them would never come back. They're still there today, right? They're still in Russian soil today, rotting away. Right? It's sad to say for them, you know, but that's, that's what happened to them, right? So he needed the labor. So that's why IG Farben made sweetheart arrangement with Nazi party, was, was allowed to set up a big factory right next door to the concentration camp with a huge pool of labor. Bring them in. Don't pay them anything. Don't feed them hardly anything. When they die, not to worry, there's not a train coming tomorrow. And the assess looks after discipline, right? Discipline, right? Okay, so good. So we have the arrangement, a wonderful arrangement for a big company. Now, this company is in the business of making money. You know, you may, maybe you do know <laughs> that in capitalism, companies have to make money. That's what it's all about. Right? Nothing else matters, right? So they make money. What are, going to be, what are they going to produce to make money? They're going to produce what the Nazi system really, really, really needs badly now. So what do they need badly? They have no more fuel, remember? They, because Auschwitz was set up in 1942, right? 
a few Auschwitz was set up. The, the Wannsee Conference, the decision to do to the Jews what they ended up doing, came if, not coincidentally a few weeks after Hitler was told that he's going to lose the war. Right? There's a connection there. Read Arno Meyer. You know, Why did the heavens not darken? That's a wonderful book that explains anti-Semitism in this context. I'm, I learned a lot from Arno Meyer. I mean, I learned from all kinds of people. But I mean, Arno Meyer's books are really wonderful in many ways. Also, his books on the Russian and French revolutions called called the Furies. You know, very good books. Uh, strongly recommend. So, so the the, the defeat or the, the the failure of the Nazi attack on the Soviet Union, the failure to bring in the resources, especially the fuel, causes a huge problem. Especially Hitler decides to continue to fight no matter what, even though Japan doesn't come in, right? So he needs fuel, but there is no more fuel. In fact, in the end, they'll be running out of fuel left and right. But you got to, we've got to do what you can. One way to keep on going in spite of running out of resources, uh, out of fuel, is to is synthetic fuel, okay? Synthetic fuel and synthetic rubber. Because petroleum and rubber are what you need to fight a modern war, the blitzkrieg, lightning war, motorized war, right? To keep planes flying, trucks rolling, you need... You need equipment, of course, but you also need fuel and you need rubber for those tires, especially in big countries like the Soviet Union with no railways. You got to move the tr troops by trucks, mostly made by General Motors and by Ford, by the way. Right? And um, so you need, you need synthetic fuel, synthetic rubber. How, how does that work? Well, you, take, you need coal to transform coal into petroleum or rubber. Germany has coal. Poland has coal. Auschwitz has coal. Auschwitz is in the coal belt of, of, of Poland. So by setting a big factory there, IG Farben can grab the Polish pole and use the Jewish labor and crank out what the Nazis need and are paying for. Again, contrary to this idea that the Nazis didn't pay, they just are told to produce for us. No, 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 no. It's a capitalist system. You know, the buyer pays. And Supply and demand, sir. You know, Adolf, supply and demand. You want synthetic fuel, it's going to be expensive. But if you want to keep on ruling Germany a little longer, you're going to pay the price, aren't you? Besides, Auschwitz also pays because the Jews that come in, those gold teeth and all these belongings, use that to pay us. Can you see how it all comes together here now? Hitler gets to exterminate the Jews. The big corporations support Hitler get to make money. Hitler gets to keep on fighting a war, which he's going to lose, but he doesn't want. He wants to fight as long as possible because when, when in on the fifth of December, nineteen forty-four, his generals tell him he can no longer win the war. In his mind, then that means his big mission of life to fight the war, the good fight on behalf of the Aryan race against the pernicious Jewish race. You know that he's not going to win it and achieve the great dream of his life, it's going to be the other way around. You know, the Aryan race is going to be wiped out by the Jewish race. You know. And since he now realizes that's inevitable in his, in his way of thinking, he decides to take as many with him as possible. And that's why all these Jews that he has under his control in Poland and later on also in Hungary and Slovakia, all these other countries, you know, bring them to Auschwitz and we'll kill them either right away or we'll work him to death. And that's the best of both worlds. So you can see how Auschwitz fits perfectly. Auschwitz is almost like, in a nutshell, the system of Nazism, of the capitalist system, of Hitler, German, of German fascism, you know, in the context of its conflict with the Soviet Union, its hatred for the Jews, it, it illustrates the whole thing. It all comes together. Hmm. Okay, Drew, have we got some more questions? Back there, Drew. Hello. There you yeah, go. Sorry, I just <laughs> That's kind of okay. thing. I'm back. <laughs> this is an action. Sorry. Um, the I've got a big, a big broad one that maybe um, maybe you both both might want to speak to. Um, okay, so what are the main lessons we should draw from the struggle against fascism in Spain, Europe, and elsewhere during the 30s and 40s? For the struggles against the resurgence of fascism today, they're asking what what are the lessons? Yeah, you know we're we're in the middle of a capitalist crisis, which yeah, that's right. 
Okay. Well, I don't know if Omar wants to say something to that or one, because I've been talking a lot already. I'd, I'd like Omar to have a chance. Omar, do you want to jump in on that one? Not that I don't have anything to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly, uh, as we all know, in 1934, 1935, uh, communists and others, they uh, created and they w wished for a broad front, a united front to uh, fight against the main enemy at that time, which was uh, fascism. Uh, today also, uh, and I, I gave you the example of uh, India, the Indian Communist Party, they were all in jail in 1941, 42, because they would not be uh, propagating for the war uh, against uh, what they claimed was the British war or the inter-imperialist war, but then they uh, started to, uh, when, when the war became an international uh, war uh, against uh, communism and socialism, they all joined in that effort. They did that to fight the common enemy as we must, in my opinion, join together to fight the common enemy of imperialism and of uh, this uh, uh, huge uh, depression that is uh, uh, at us, coming at us. At the same time, we must keep our uh, uh, minds to the fight for socialism also. It can't be one or the other, it's got to be both, a fight against imperialism, against uh, the uh, uh, effects of the depression, against uh, the massive uh, unemployment, hunger, uh, inequality, et cetera, uh, fight for reforms, uh, but at the same time, keep uh, our uh, eyes on the goal that it is capitalism, just as in uh, the case of Nazism, it was capitalism that created the huge issue for us that in the end, we will have to fight capitalism and get rid of it to get rid of the problems that are afflicting us. Yeah. Jacques, did you want to jump in on that one at all? Well, no, I'd rather leave it at that because as an historian, I'd rather have more used to looking backward. I mean, I have some ideas, but I'd rather leave it at that. Yeah. Right. The, uh, the issue, if you uh, both of you would like to comment on as well, the issue of what we seem to be seeing, which is uh, more and more funding going into some of these uh, ultra-right uh, organizations in the United States around the pandemic, these some of the organizations that have been uh, demonstrating to open up early have apparently are being funded uh, by some corporate funders and, and they're they're coming out with their guns and they occupied uh, uh, the legislature in, in Michigan with, with uh, assault rifles, et cetera. Does this have the same flavor in, in terms of, do you see that as, as, a, as a fascist development or a, as, a, as a proto or a potential fascist development in the face of a crisis? Well, the, the, there's lessons to be learned from history. And sometimes the, the wrong lessons are learned from history. <laughs> but when, when you look at the rise of fascism in Germany, for example, which is of course in many ways the most important example, although the rise of fascism in Italy came earlier and therefore is also very instructive. When you look at the rise of fascism and you look at how, how a fascist movement like that of Hitler was supported from the start by some big bucks, um, and by industrialists and so on, there are thousands, well, okay, hundreds of historians who will tell you, well, that means nothing because you know, so many, so many um, uh, industrialists did not support him. And so many of them, as, as is the case today, support all kinds of political parties. I mean, we all know that the same corporations make donations to the Conservative Party, the Liberals, and even the NDP, you know, because why wouldn't they? They have enough money to go around, and it's good to have friends everywhere, you know, and it's like a way kind of insurance, you know, why would you put all your money in the same in one basket? And the, the game, the name of the electoral game is that, you know, so one day the Liberals win, the next time the Conservatives will win. You want to make sure that you always have your friends in, in these parties. And it worked similar in with with the, with the fascists in the early in the early twenties, for example, when Hitler was on the rise, his early rise was very slow. I mean, he was uh, he was immediately the, the, he was seen to be perceived to be rightly so 
as an aggressive bugger, you will to use violence to basically to beat, beat down, you know, beat up, or that could be useful for counter-revolutionary and democratic purposes and so on, you know. But, and he was supported by some industrialists right away. But then when you point that out, some historians will say, yeah, but the majority of industrialists didn't see that. It was a few, a few nuts, you know, yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. But the reality is that the, the German corporations already in the 20s did the same thing that corporations now do. You know, they, they preferred, they didn't, many of them did not see Hitler as their, their first option. They had other options. They preferred the conservative, traditional conservative parties, you know, I mean, respectable bourgeois parties, like the conservative party today, for example, the liberal party, you know, and even in some cases with the social democratic party, because they're not revolutionary, you know, they don't threaten to change, they want one or a few reforms. I mean, I see socialists or social democrats as the party of Keynesianism, you know, they're not really a party of socialism, they're a party of Keynesianism, right? So, but, but they also don't want to exclude the possibility, that perhaps think about the in future, perhaps just in case, in the future, this guy could be useful. And uh, that is how we should look at Hitler also. For a long time, uh, the corporate Germany you know, did not really see that much potential in Hitler, but they didn't neglect him either. You know, they kept him, they gave just enough money to keep him you know, alive, just in case. And fascism, fascism, is the stick to the mm -hmm. carrot. Capitalism, capitalism, as we know it, historically has, has developed. And even today, can offer you a carrot or can use a stick, all right? I, I wrote a paper once about that. I should find it somewhere. You know, it's called, it's called how, how the welfare state is the carrot and fascism is the stick. For example, in the 30s, when fascism is, uh, when capitalism feels really threatened, feel really threatened, it uses the stick. That's fascism in the 30s. In 1945, when fascism was defeated, the stick suddenly was out of favor. The carrot, the welfare state was brought in, even here in Canada, right? And in Europe, in Britain, the, you know, the beverage plant, the welfare state, suddenly capitalism became really nice. You know, capitalism with a human face. You know? And that's why you can see how capital, well, how fascism is called upon. The stick is is basically becomes useful again when uh, when capitalism right. the system is under pressure, right? And that's what's happening now in many ways. You know, and there's no threat the way there was in the 30s, but I mean, there's certainly unemployment and growing misery and and, and financial problems is going to pay for all that. And a lot of people are getting very restless. And indeed, look at friends, the yellow vests and all that stuff. That is a kind of a potentially a revolutionary movement. And that's when, when Macron has started to use the stick already. You've got these policemen coming out and you have all these organizations being formed. Okay, and, and, and there's more of them than we know because they're usually behind the scenes. But I mean, there are these, these organizations that have has fascist toy it, you mm -hmm. know, Crazy fascist, whatever you want to call it, and that's that's why. But another another aspect here is that there's a situation in the in the heartland of capitalism, in the imperialist heartland, Western Europe, North America, right. and the periphery, the third world today, the ex colonies. Right. Essentially, we've got to keep in mind that capitalism used the carrot already on the eve of the second of the first world war by bringing in certain reforms at the expense of the colonies okay mm -hmm. essentially the, the restless potentially dangerous revolutionary working class in europe in the heartland was appeased was pacified with by, with, with with concessions that were financed by increased exploitation in the third world i think omar will agree with that there's a wonderful book about that called um, uh, called the Divided Cla World Divided Class by Zach Cope. I don't know if you know him. There's also a book about settler capitalism and so on. There's a number of books I could recommend here to you know to the listeners and the readers. But um, that's another thing again. So you're more likely you're more likely to have the great misery that leads to the great restlessness and discontent that then causes capitalism to react to re reach for a stick in the third world. And in a way, what we have now is that this is happening. This is there's more likely to be to be discontent, and the revolutionary movement has more potential in the third world, and therefore fascism has great potential in the third world as well. Yeah, that's that's just a consideration. But I mean, you'd have to look at each case, of course. And Omar knows this much better than I do. But 
um, India, is Pakistan, you know, Africa, South America, for example. You know. Omar, did you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Yaksa said. Uh, but the thing is that in the United States, in England, in Germany, in France, and in, even in Canada, the ruling elites pay a lot more attention to profits than to human life. And so there has been no shutdown worth the name in the United States or in England and very late and uh, in uh, Italy, in uh, uh, France, etc. Because their thinking is that let us make money, let not uh, anything or anybody interrupt making profits. And for the workers, if 100,000 die, 200,000 die, 300,000 die, whatever, we, we have such a reserve army of labor, we will always find labor and cheap labor to keep on working the economy, making uh, uh, profits for us. It's a very inhumane, uh, a very uh, anti-human uh, way of thinking, but that's what capitalism is nowadays. Okay, thank you. Drew, what, have we got anything else here? Well, we still have quite a few questions, but how much um, how much time do we have? Like, do you want me to keep going single or you want me to throw a few oh, out there? Okay, so should we set a limit on this? Uh, we, we're at almost nine o'clock. Should we give ourselves another 15, 20 minutes at the most and then call it an evening? Or how do you gentlemen feel? Yeah, I'm happy with another 20 minutes. It's fine. Okay, so we'll give ourselves 15, 20 minutes to answer as many questions as we can. Um, or if you want to select ones that you think haven't been touched on, Drew? Okay, so I'll throw out, yeah, the ones that haven't been touched on here, I'll, I'll put two out. Um, so could the question of partisan groups operating in Eastern Europe be discussed, particularly Jewish partisan groups often armed by the USSR? And I'll, I'll try and expand the question a little bit because um, I think it would be interesting to talk more about... Uh, you know, the partisan and, and other resistance to fascism's uh, mm. a role in defeating fascism in Europe and also uh, in Asia too, where there were specific countries that had strong resistance against Japanese um, occupation. And then the, the second question, to what extent did the comprador classes in peripheral states benefit from the imperialist relation? In Gunder Frank, I read the ruling families, for example, in Brazil, remain the same from the colonial era. I imagine there's continuity through the war years there and I'm curious if such relations persist in Africa and Asia, et cetera. Hmm. Okay. All right, so the issue, the first one was the, sorry, rem, rem, put the, the first one back on the table. The second one I got, <laughs> the first one I saw was- The partisan groups. The partisan groups, excellent. Thank you very much. I'm glad somebody raised that. I wanted to hear about it myself. How how significant and what role did did they play, and how how was it in fact run by the Soviet Union? Well, the partisans in the Soviet Union are part of the of partisans in resistance everywhere in occupied Europe. Uh, in the Soviet Union, I want to say briefly about it that there was a the partisan movement was a big factor in in fighting off the Germans in 1941. And eventually mm. allowing the Soviet Union to become to emerge victoriously from the war. I mean, the Germans in their great hurry to get to the oil the oil fields of the Caucasus into Moscow and Leningrad all at the same time, you know, had to bypass huge areas, including forests and so on, where entire units of the Red Army actually were were had take refuge and organize themselves. And uh, the partisans were highly organized. And of course, the, the distances in the Soviet Union are such. And the communication that's were difficult, and the lines of the, the, the lines with, with, along which the, the supplies to be brought up for the Germans are so vulnerable that the partisans played a very very important role. I'm not a military historian at all, and that's really all I can say about it. But I know that that's very important, and it's also similarly obvious. Another two more things that the, that the, the, the Nazis, Hitler especially, and the Nazis had expected basically the whole population of the Soviet Union to welcome them as liberators. You know. And there's still lots of historians who say that, that, that that's what it was. It's, it's just simply not true. I mean, there were the collaborators, there were 
everywhere. And the most famous example of that is some of these Ukrainian nationalists that, that helped the Nazis and committed some of the biggest war crimes against Jews and so on, because they shared the same Judeo-Bolshevik kind of ideas of Hitler and of uh, Henry Ford. They saw every Jew a commie, a commie and every commie a Jew, right? And uh, the commissars and the, and the Jews were immediately executed or, uh, immediately. So, so obviously Jews played an important role in the partisan uh, movement in the, in the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. And uh, the partisan movement then was much stronger, much more potent uh, than the non-existence that was expected from them, so to speak, right? That's one thing. Secondly, the partisans, the resistance everywhere in Europe was much more important than we have usually been led to believe. And there's a reason for that. Uh, for example, France had a major resistance movement, but usually it's presented as, uh, well, you know what I mean? They didn't really do much, you know what I mean? They just came out when the Americans came to liberate them. Then they were all there. Then, yeah, then they were suddenly all like in the resistance. Right? Well, that's also bullshit. I mean, the, 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 the resistance was very important, extremely important. In fact, much more, much more important than we believe, than we led to believe, which raises the question, why, why does our traditional historiography and the media and the Hollywood movies, except for glorifying a few individuals, usually overdone. You know, why? Why is that? And the answer is because everywhere in Europe, the resistance was very left-wing and mostly led by the communists, and they had plans for after the liberation that were not simply a return to the status quo ante, back to where we were before, back to the dirty thirties. No. The answer was, we're going to have a, a new future. We have a new system. We're going to move away from the old system. We're going to have socialism. And because especially as the war had progressed, after, after it became clear, what was not yet clear in December 41, other than to Hitler and a few people, that Hitler was going to lose the war, that became obvious after the Titanic Battle of Stalingrad. And then in France, for example, everybody knew that Hitler was going to be kaput shortly, that the Soviet Union was going to be the winner. And that was a tremendous boost for the image of the Soviet Union and for the image of socialism. And many people in France said, well, France was in the, was in the pits before the war. Uh, so was most of the Western world was, was basically in a deep depression with no way out. The idea that, that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal solved the problem is utter nonsense. It's the war that dragged the system out of, 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 of the depression. It's a war that re-stimulated demand, which is why, why when the war ended, a new war had to be started because otherwise, what would these factories keep on producing? You know, mm. And what would we, what, how would we find jobs for all these GIs coming back? So the Cold War had to take over where the hot war left off. The Cold War was needed, it was needed by, by the Western system essentially you know, to keep demand going, right? And when the Cold War suddenly finished, Unhappily, you might say, when our dear enemy, the Soviet Union, suddenly collapsed, quick, there was a search on for another enemy. And they looked and they found, at one point, that might be China. Well, that, that's a bit hard, a tough guy to take on. But then, thank God for Saddam Hussein, Milosevic. Immediately, we found new Hitlers everywhere, didn't we? And started bombing the hell out of them to bring democracy. Bombing is a great way to, to bring democracy to countries. Anyway, so that's what I want to say about, about the resistance. The resistance movement, then, today, is, suffers from an image that it's all oh, well, it wasn't important. It was important. It was important militarily and it was important for the plans it had, you know. Anyways, I've just written, wrote an article about that, about France and the resistance, and that's available on global research as well. Omar, what about the resistance in Asia? What was what was uh, happening there? Yeah, so after, independ uh, after independence, why did the Comprador or the national bourgeoisies uh, keep power? And this is a lament of many poets, many writers, uh, progressive writers, that we have just changed masters from white-skinned ones to brown-skinned ones or black-skinned ones. And the reason is that while communists and progressives played a very crucial role in some instances uh, and uh, led the fight against the colonial uh, occupiers, when it came to independence itself, they were not large enough, they were not big enough to be hegemonic in their societies. Mm -hmm. Just look at the example of Iran. It's a different context, but Iran, a massive, massive revolution takes place. The Communist Party is there, but it is not as strong as the mullahs who are uh, backed by the bazaar. Uh, look at Indonesia. 
a very big communist party. And when it looks as if it is about to take power or it might take power, the genocide that takes place up to a million people in 1965, mainly ethnically Chinese, all belonging to the communist or the progressive movement are massacred. Uh, China was different. There, the Communist Party was hegemonic and they were able to kick out not only the foreign uh, occupiers, uh, but also their own national limited bourgeoisie as it was uh, and their own landlords, etc. So I think that is the fundamental reason why uh, in India, uh, the Communist Party of India played a very heroic role uh, in the liberation of uh, India, but because, uh, and it was a very effective party, a national party, it couldn't because it was not as big as the bourgeois parties of the Congress uh, in India and the Muslim League in Pakistan. Um, may I add something to that? Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to add to that, that, that in many cases, the transition from, colo from colonialism to independence was, of course, this very thoroughly supervised by the colonial powers Indeed. and structured to their advantage and to the advantage of, of the comprador bourgeoisie that, that was willing to, to keep things as they were, to keep right. colonialism arrive, alive in the neo-colonial shape and form. I'm from Belgium and I know what happened in the Congo in 1960. I mean, the leader was, was Lumumba. Lumumba was not a communist, but he certainly had, was willing to work with the Soviet Union and he had a mass following. That was not to the liking of the Belgians and of the mm -hmm. CIA, who completely murdered him, basically, and installed a dictator that, that, that they liked. That's a pretty crude example. But even in other countries, basically, it was arranged for the tools of power, the instruments of power, to be handed to the elements you know, in the independence movement that were moderate, as opposed to the extremists that were perhaps dreaming of Soviet-style reforms. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. I think we have time for another one, Drew, if we have uh, another couple of short questions, we should take them. Sure, so um, there's requests to bring, we've kind of moved on from this a little bit, but there's requests to bring this back. So um, why did Hitler attack Western Europe first instead of the USSR uh, during the war? Okay. And what is the relationship of the non-aggression pact um, and the decision to, by Nazi Germany to invade Western Europe and the UK. I don't know if that's the same, the same question yeah, or not. The same thing. Well, I'm going to try to make this very short. Essentially, in the years before the pact, you know, Stalin, Soviet Union wanted an, an, an alliance, an agreement, a defensive arrangement with Britain and France. Okay, because they knew damn well in Moscow, they knew damn well that Hitler wanted to basically go grab their throat, right, and, and wipe them out. In London and in Paris, they did not want that because they wanted the opposite. They wanted Hitler to go for it and attack the Soviet Union. But they couldn't say that because the public in both France and Britain was very anti-Nazi. They hated Hitler. You know? And a lot of them, a lot of people, especially there was still a working class in many of these countries, you know, sympathized with the Soviet Union, either because they were communists or they were sympathetic you know, to what was happening in the Soviet Union, where, for example, there was no unemployment. There was no Great Depression. There was problems, but not, you know, nothing like the like the, in the West where there was, seemed to be no hope. It seemed like the capitalism was collapsing for good. Anyway, so, so there was a lot of sympathy. So the public, the public in these countries had, had, had kept an eye on what their leaders were doing. So the leaders of Britain, especially Chamberlain and France, Daladier, you know, were forced to agree to talk to the Soviets about an alliance without wanting this alliance. And they were, they were actually forced to fool the public to pretend that they, yes they saw Hitler as, a, as an enemy whereas in reality they were saw him as a wonderful guy who was going to do the dirty work for them they could not say the unspeakable they could not say okay guys okay look we're trying to set up Hitler to attack the Soviet Union don't you get it of course they couldn't say that so they had to put up a show and that whole show that's a policy of appeasement as we call it you know it was on the one hand pretending to want to be able to negotiate with the Soviet Union, you know, but at the same time also sending signals to Hitler that 
it's okay. You know, you can do what you want. Do you need Austria? Take Austria. You want to remilitarize Germany? Remilitarize Germany. You want whatever you want because we know you need all the weapons and the instruments to attack the Soviet Union. So they gave him everything. You know, the moment actually when there was a wonderful opportunity to to make this agreement, to create this alliance between the Soviet Union on the one hand and England, Britain and France on the other hand, was the crisis that led to the Munich Agreement. When actually Czechoslovakia, which was a pretty military strong country, you know, was being was under threat by, so, by, by Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union proposed an alliance at that stage, right? And at that stage, if, if there would have been an alliance of Britain and France and the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia, Hitler's army would have had no chance against them. You know? And uh, that's why they were, you know, they, 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 that's why to avoid that, to avoid having to make that obvious arrangement that the people wanted, they flew to Berl, to Munich and actually gave Hitler exactly what he wanted. You know? And came back and they to defend to the public what they were doing, they said, peace. We're just doing it because we want peace in our time. They were playing that card. They knew that people really didn't want a war. Obviously, after the First World War, people weren't keen to see another war, but they didn't want to appease Hitler. But they appeased Hitler. So they played that card. Now, Hitler, from Hitler's perspective, this is all wonderful. You know, he gets everything he wants. He wants Austria, he gets Austria. He gets the, he wants the Czechoslovakia, Czech Czechoslovakia. Then he occupies the rest of Czechoslovakia and never a peep from London, you know, they say, well, they protest a little bit, but it means nothing. So he loves that game. He loves that game. And that's when he turns to Poland. He says, now I want Danzig. And when that comes up, this is now March 1939. Yeah. Now, the, that the public in France and Britain is furious. And Daladier in France and Chamberlain in Britain cannot possibly say we're going to give me that concession. It's impossible. It's just impossible. But they've given him enough. He can do it without. He's just bluffing. So we just we just make a big dramatic gesture that will impress our public and make Hitler do what he, what he wanted to do, attack the Soviet Union, without making what that are demand with respect to Poland. And Poland, that's another case that we could talk about separately. Why and, then Why then did Hitler actually attack Western Europe? Well, well this, this is what I'm going to say. So, so Hitler now, Hitler now realizes, or he, 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 he's ticked off that London and Paris, having made all these concessions before, now refuse him this little morsel of Danzig. What's the big deal, right? What's the big deal? Why don't I get that? So he now thinks, my God, they're double-crossing me. In Germany, there's a tradition back to the First World War, that perfect Albion, you know, that those Brits, you just can't trust them. You know, Maybe they're trying to set me up. And when I move to the East, to the Soviet Union, they may stab me in the back. They may attack me in the back. Uh, so Hitler now is getting suspicious about that. And he decides that maybe, just maybe, he better make sure that when he goes for, when he starts out, to fulfill his big mission, which is the war against the Soviet Union, that he's not going to be attacked from behind. So mm -hmm. he decides to attack the West first. And you may say, well, that's pretty ambitious. Well, for that, first of all, he needs to make sure that he's not going to attack himself in the back from the East. That's why he proposes to Moscow, to Stalin, to conclude a non-aggression treaty, right? And Stalin eventually, well, that's what else could he have done, essentially? He had tried to try it forever you know, to make a deal with London and Paris and didn't want to, right? And now, Hitler can focus on attacking Poland, knowing full well, and this is another thing, knowing full well that France and England are not going to attack, even though they declare war. They have to declare war when Hitler attacks Poland. And, and even though London and Paris had threatened him with war if he did so, he knows they're not going to attack. And he knows that because in Britain and in France, there's a lot of people who sympathize big time with Hitler. As I told you already, and the elite sympathized with Hitler and they hate the Soviet Union and they're willing to make sacrifices. They sacrificed Austria already. They sacrificed Czechoslovakia. They don't mm -hmm. give a shit about Poland. Okay? They're willing to give all that up for their big dream of seeing Hitler march the Teutonic hordes towards, towards Berlin. Right? And that's what they want to do. And that's what they, that's, and Hitler knows that. Now we know, for example, in England, just the other day I saw on television Edward VIII, you know, who became king temporarily. Then abdicated because of his love affair with this uh, with Mrs. Simpson, this divorcee, and then he goes to to visit Hitler and he's big buddy with Hitler, and that's always represented as an anomaly 
It's not true. The upper class Brits loved Hitler. There was only a few who didn't, one being Churchill, but most of them did big time. The Bank of England, you know, the, 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 the big, they, they loved Hitler, right? They, they liked him a lot. And the same in France. And we know, we know that in France, that in France, the elites of France, and I want to focus on France for a moment. This is very important. The elites of France, the political elites, the economic elites, the military elites, who are all traditionally very anti-communist. They're the ones who had sent troops to the Soviet Union in the Civil War to fight with the whites, right? And they, they have a big communist move party in France, you know, and that's a big thorn in their side, right? And then they would love, they see what happens in, in, in neighboring Italy, Mussolini comes to power, it wipes out the commies, and they say, that's great. And then a little later in Germany, Hitler comes to power, he wipes out the communists, and they say, that's great. You know, when are we going to do that? And in 1934, there's a sort of a wimpy attempt to do the same thing, and it backfires. And instead, a popular front comes to power. You have a government of commies and socialists, and my God, liberals still, oh my God, it's a catastrophe. And that's when these elites decide if we can set up a fascist system ourselves in France, we can import one. And how are we going to import it? Well, I'm, 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 I must go too fast, but by losing a war against Germany. And that's exactly what happened. And by the way, this is documented big time, okay? And by, I can refer you to some books about that. What essentially happened is that there were signals sent to Hitler already in 39, that if he would attack Poland, that he would not have to worry about the French and the British attacking in the West. If they would have done so, it would have been a catastrophic as, as Hitler's generals knew. But Hitler knew they weren't going to do that. In fact, there was the phony war, it was called, right? The British and the French sat on their rear ends, did nothing as the German Poland and wipe out the Poles, right? And they did nothing. It was the phony war, meaning a fake war. They pretended to be a war. They were hoping for this whole thing to be over in Poland so that Hitler could then move, move to the east and they would find a solution for the problem, right? But Hitler, as I mentioned now, Hitler knew that France didn't want to fight. And that's why when he attacked, he knew very well that the French would roll over and play dead. If you're a general of an army, like in France, and you make plans for a war, you make plans to win a war, there's no guarantee you're going to win it. But if you're the generals of an army and you make plans to lose a war, you're guaranteed to lose it. It's exactly what happened in France. They call in France the, the, the strange defeat, the tranche defeat of 1940, right? And it's now known, it's known for sure, it's documented that the French essentially let the Germans in. Why? So that goddamn democratic government could get the hell out of there and it install a nice fascist ruler. Pétain comes in, big buddy. And that's problem solved. Hitler knew that. And that's why mm -hmm. Hitler, could, Hitler could afford to, you know, basically move against Poland and then move into the West waiting essentially that they would be waiting with open arms for him, which they did in France. And same thing in Belgium, by the way, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what happened there. Okay. Do we have time for another one, Drew, or do you think this is uh, where we should draw on a line under it? Um, there, there's no, yeah, I, I think that's pretty much the, the end of it. Um, okay, all right. Well, thank you, Drew, and thank you, Jay, for providing all the technical assistance to me, who was technically incompetent, uh, so I needed all that backup, and I thank very much our speakers. I was really, I mean, just a, an incredible uh, illumination of, of a lot of issues from both of you. I really appreciate everything that you've been able to bring to us this evening, and I'm sure our audience has as well. So I want to thank you both very much. I should also point out, uh, because we are on a uh, People's Voice forum, that the People's Voice is the newspaper of the Communist Party that carries the message of the Communist Party of Canada to the to Canadians and throughout the world. And uh, it, we are in the middle of a press drive. And I would urge everyone who has enjoyed this forum and appreciated uh, what we've been able to uh, bring to you this evening to go to the People's Voice website and to find a way to make a contribution so that we, the People's Voice uh, forums, can continue to bring even 
more in the future. We will, I hope, be able to do that. So I urge you very much to uh, make your contribution and help this paper stay alive. I also, again, want to thank Jacques Pauls, who is the historian and, and author of the books that we've told you about, and will hopefully be able to read more of those in the future. And Omar, as always, has uh, provided his insight, um, which has always been valuable to, to us in, in all of the forums that he's spoken at. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Have a pleasant evening. Stay safe, stay healthy. Goodbye. Good Take care. Leaving the meeting. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>